Business and Poverty Committee, Los Angeles City Council. Today is Thursday, February 11th. We're ably supported by Ms. Campos from the City Clerk's Office and Ms. O'Neill from the City Attorney's Office and Mr. Wickham from the Chief Legislative Analyst's Office. Uh, we do have a full uh, agenda before us and uh, work our way through it as um, efficiently and fairly as we possibly can. And with that in mind, I would ask the clerk uh, please establish. Yes, sir. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, Council Member Riley Thomas as chair. Here. Council Member De Leon. Here. Council Member Raman. Here. Council Member Rodriguez. Here. And Council Member Buscaino. Good morning, here. We have five members and a quorum, sir. Thank you very kindly, uh, Ms. Campos. Good morning, members. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we do have um, a rather substantial uh, agenda today. Um, we begin with a public comment, um, and I'm now going to ask um, that the uh, city attorney um, establishes the ground rules for our benefit. Ms. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To the members of the public calling in, when it is your turn to speak, please state your name and which of the agenda items you wish to speak on. You will have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more items. In addition, those who would like to address the committee with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum of up to three minutes per person for all agenda items, including general public comment. We will inform you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on an agenda item, you will get one brief warning from the city attorney or the chair. If you do not immediately get clearly back on topic, or if you again stray off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time, and we will move on to the next speaker. We will take up to 40 minutes total of public comment today. Please press star to request to speak. As soon as you hear someone address you on the phone, please press star six and state your name and state which agenda items you would like to speak on. Thank you for your cooperation. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam City Attorney. Um, now let's hear from the clerk uh, who will give us instructions for the public to call in. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-431-9380 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted to, for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. Please note, if you are listening to the meeting on a computer or speakerphone, you will need to turn down the volume on those devices before you speak. If you do not turn down the volume, there will be an echo. Again, once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. That concludes the instructions, Mr. Chair. Uh, we thank you. Uh, we're ready to proceed uh, with public comment. There are several persons who do wish to be heard. May we have the first speaker, please? Caller with the last four numbers ending in 4929, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi, I'm Mr. Kelly and I wish to speak on item 5 and general public comment. Could you repeat that? So, the vision is amazing. The fact that the city will be reimbursed for going forward with this hotel plan is amazing. So, we have to take advantage of that fully. 
So th- this motion has to pass today, and it should be waived through the COVID committee and just sent to the city council for the vote next Tuesday. We should maximize the amount of hotel rooms we have available because this is a great opportunity. Not only are these shelter options not of aggregate, they're private, and they're there and they're vacant. So why not use them? So I think we should pass that and get that voted on next Tuesday, have that pass, and shelter and what we need most of need. And for general public comment, as we talk about the city next Tuesday, we have to stop the streets. People should be allowed to stay in their apartment until we can provide them shelter and open up back to work better. I know everyone wants to have like food up and all of that, but we're just moving people. They're mostly in the name of sidewalk aesthetic, and we have to stop until we can actually provide logical Okay, shelter options. So now, congregate shelters, um, come to the hotel. We're making it. 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 we are making it we are making it we Good morning, council members. Uh, this is Ula Romero with the LA County Federation of Labor calling for item number one, the right to housing. You, have one behalf of, you may begin. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of President Ron Herrera and the 800,000 members of the LA County Federation of Labor, we want to express our support for item number one, the right to housing. Uh, COVID-19 has exacerbated many issues, among them the moral crises of housing and homelessness. Our members and the community at large know we can and must do more. And this is why we support the goal of establishing a right to housing framework and exploring the legal and funding mechanisms to make it a reality. Uh, we thank the council for the leadership on this issue and look forward to collaborating and uh, working on this together. Thank you. We thank you for your testimony. We'll take the next speaker. Call with the last four numbers ending in 2538. Please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Call with the last four numbers ending in 2538. Please press star 6 to unmute. Okay, caller with the last numbers ending in 5210. Please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Caller with the last four numbers ending in 5210. Please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hi, um, I'm in Angelino. I am not giving my name today because I know people have been targeted. I want to speak about the Care Plus cleanups. Um, I'm requesting that the council resume them. I fully respect the intentions behind this motion for voluntary cleanups, but the reality on the ground is different. I've personally helped unhoused neighbors remove unwanted trash that covered more than half a block. And they complained to me about the fact that this trash was vermin infested. I saw with my own eyes that it had rotting foodstuffs in it. And the reason it was there is because this was trash that the city hadn't been able to pick up for weeks because the person storing it didn't live in the encampment. And so there was no one there on the days that LA Sand came to volunteer to let them take it away. So the Care Plus system, I believe, was designed with the intention of protecting our unhoused neighbors, and I think the Care Plus should be able to continue. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, we'll now go to the next speaker. Call over the last four numbers ending in 7186. Please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi, yes, my name is Alex. I'm calling from CD10 that has over 1,200 unhoused people speaking on agenda items 5, 6, 7, and general public comment. 
You have three minutes. You may begin. Um, so for item five, you need to jump on these items now and deal with urgency. I am so tired of the council acting like we aren't in a pandemic and we don't have an unhoused epidemic. It sounds like city council is reluctant to act on on the FEMA funds because they don't know where the money is going to come from or when they're going to get it back. I'd like to remind you that there is $150 million from the LAPD budget just sitting around waiting to get used that the mayor, the mayor vetoed, and you guys have more power than the mayor, so go get it because LAPD is trying to take it back. You can easily use that. This small fund is just sitting there and take that and use it. Project Room Key has, I think, only had 10% success rate. We only have like 8,000 shelter beds for over 70,000 unhoused people, not to mention when evictions are happening, whether or not they're legal, and people are losing their jobs constantly, we're going to have even more people that are going to be losing their homes. They, people can't afford to pay their health insurance. The people are in debt. People are one bill away from houselessness. You need to act on this now and with urgency. Pass it through. Get it to city council on Tuesday. Stop the care sweeps. Unlike the last caller said, they are not helpful. The CDC has said that if you don't allow these people to shelter in place, it spreads COVID, especially because LAPD does not wear masks and several of them are dying from COVID. Like the Dalai Lama says, if you cannot help someone, then don't harm them. Care sweeps are harming people. They have 15 minutes to grab all of their belongings, and then the LAPD presence there will arrest them if they're not if they won't take shelter. Uh, one minute shelters. remaining. There's one minute remaining. Thank you. Congregate shelters spread COVID. I know because my sister has had to bounce between shelters and hotel rooms. You can see the hotels that will have them be individually sheltered in place, and if you're not going to do that, leave them the fuck alone. There are, there are more than five unhoused people dying a day. That is on you. Act now. Stop the care sweeps. Get the hotels. Like, just please, for the love of God, do something. That's the end of my time. Thank you. We thank you for your testimony. We'll take the next speaker, please. Caller with the last four numbers ending in 2425, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Caller with the number ending in 2425, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Okay, next caller. Oh, Next caller. Next caller. Okay. caller with the number ending in 8219, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hello, this is Greg Spiegel from Inner City Law Center. I'd like to speak on item number one and for general public comment, please. You have two minutes. You may begin. I'm calling to support a right to housing in Los Angeles as a long overdue when necessary strategy to finally tackle the city's displacement, eviction, and affordable housing crisis. In addition to the number of homeless people already on the street, there are 500,000 plus families in LA County earning less than $55,000 per year who cannot afford the home they currently live in. And the burden isn't evenly distributed. Black families and Latinx families are more likely to be severely rent burdened and evicted than white families. And single mothers of color are the most likely to be evicted. The right to housing is needed because the market won't and never has addressed the housing needs of low-income people. A right to housing is a permanent home. It's not a cot in a shelter. A shelter can be preferable to the street, but it's not a home, and certainly not a permanent one from which someone can build their life. A right to housing is a home that someone can afford, meaning you can pay rent and pay for the other necessities of life, like food, medication, clothes, schooling, utilities. You should be able to afford everything a family needs and afford housing. Right to housing is an equity strategy that addresses the historic segregation and ongoing systemic racism that makes it more likely that you will be evicted if you are black or Latinx or a single mother of color. A right to housing is a home that is stable. It's more than a physical housing unit. It's a having a home that is free from threats of harassment, intimidation, and unjust eviction. It provides people with a stable life rooted in their community. And if that stability is under threat, it provides access to resources to protect the home, including a right to counsel. 
and it displays the tenant does, doesn't have legal barriers that prevent her from getting another home. A right to housing is a home that is habitable. It's not a slum. A right to housing is a home that is in a safe and well-resourced neighborhood. A right to housing is a home that is available throughout the city, <clears throat> regardless of historic segregation and exclusionary zoning. A right to housing is a massive public investment in affordable housing development. And finally, a right to housing is necessary if the city is ever going to solve its housing crisis. Thank you. Well, thank you for your testimony. We'll now take the next speaker. Caller with the last four numbers ending in 2283, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the item you wish to speak on. Hi, this is Harris Rosenblum, and I'd like to speak on item 157 and general comment. You have two minutes for the item and one minute for general public comment. You may begin. Uh, on behalf of the Los Angeles Business Council, uh, we fully support the concept of establishing a right to housing framework within the city of Los Angeles. LA worsening housing and homelessness crises remain the highest priority issue among LA residents. And if we want to seriously address it, we must craft solutions that meet the magnitude of the problem. Housing is one of the few public goods that we treat as a commodity rather than a necessity. And creating a right to housing aims to address this lack of a legal framework when it comes to providing a roof over the head of Angelinas. Uh, the right to housing is a key priority for the LABC and for our working group on urgent homeless solutions consisting of leaders from the private, nonprofit, and philanthropic sectors. Um, we believe this intersectoral group can help promote and advocate for policy solutions that will propel our homelessness efforts across the region. We must find ways to encourage urgent and bold action to hold our city accountable to creating housing solutions that will move people off the street and into homes quickly and effectively. The current plan is not sustainable. We look forward to working with Council Member Ridley Thomas's office on this motion and others to address rising homelessness within the city of Los Angeles. Uh, with regard to item five, the LABC would like to express our concern with the approach of commandeering hotels and motels before the city exhausts all other available pathways to expand the program. While we agree that Project Green Key should be renewed and expanded, we believe there are several steps that can and should be taken before such a decision is made with wide-ranging implications. To take full advantage of the increased FEMA reimbursement, uh, the city should conduct a full inventory of all hotels and motels to determine who would voluntarily participate and the expansion of Project Room Key. Uh, the city should look at increasing the flexibility of the program to expand program eligibility to smaller unit hotels and motels. Uh, by allowing every possible site to participate, the city will improve the effectiveness of a newly expanded okay. Project Room Key. Yeah, right to housing. Okay. Only then should we be making well-informed decisions about the potential number of additional hotels the city would need to provide shelter for our neighbors experiencing homelessness. Uh, and then the LABC would also like to express our support for Councilmember De Leon's motion regarding assessing the feasibility of utilizing city-owned properties. Just in this last year, the crisis has only worsened due to COVID-19, uh, and we know that more people fall into homelessness than exit out on a daily basis. We support Councilmember De Leon's comprehensive recommendations in a way home on how to strengthen our focus on creative housing solutions and process to ensure that by 2025 we can accommodate the thousands of Angelinos that are left without shelter or housing. Uh, Los Angeles needs to retool the process for creating housing in a more efficient and cost-effective manner while also focusing on moving people off the street into all forms of housing as quickly as possible. Uh, this motion uh, will push Los Angeles in the right direction. About 15 even seconds remaining, sir. Okay, thank you. The LABC thanks you for your steadfast leadership on these issues, and we are excited about continuing to work towards uh, addressing this critical need uh, to provide housing opportunities for all Angelinos. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We thank you for your testimony this morning. Uh, we'll take the next caller, please. Caller with the last four numbers, 6022. Please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Caller with the last four digits ending in 6022. Please press star 6 to unmute. Okay, call her with the last four digits. Oh, hi, I'm here. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, my name's Danny, and I'd like to speak on agenda item five um, and general public comment. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general public comment. You may begin. Thank you. It is really, really, really vital that LA City Council passes this motion and ensures that it is met with the urgency and crisis this requires. I 
ask you to wave it through the COVID committee and send it directly to city council for a vote on Tuesday. We are losing people. We have already lost so many people. And if we're going to continue to not act with urgency, that is only going to exacerbate our crisis. We should focus on maximizing the number of hotel rooms and using this to address the COVID-19 crisis. We must prioritize hotels as safe options for housing, not tiny homes, not congregate shelters that are just a hub for COVID-19. Hotels can turn into permanent social housing. I really don't understand how we have not seized the hotels. There are 40,000 vacant. To just let them stay empty while people are dying on the streets is unforgivable. And I'm really disappointed with the leadership that I have seen so far. I will now be moving into general public comment. I monitor sweeps every week in CD15. And today we were met with seven police officers. I don't know about you, but the cops don't make me feel safe. And police do not belong in any space, but do not. They do not belong at a Care Plus sweep. If I and other outreach workers can safely provide aid without the presence of law enforcement, there is zero reason why LA Sanitation should not be able to do the same. Unhoused people are arrested at 17 times the rate as the overall population in LA, and one in three incidences of use of force by LAPD is against an unhoused person. 40% of unhoused Angelinos are black. Joe, I now speak directly to you. about 15 seconds remaining now. Your performative activism is pathetic. You cannot say Black Lives Matter and also support criminalizing homelessness. I am so thoroughly disgusted with your leadership, Joe, and I hope you choose to be the leader you are. Do the right thing, seize the hotels, and reinvest in our communities. People need services, not suites. We thank you for your testimony. We'll take the next caller. Caller with the last four digits ending in 9204. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Please no, state your name. Hi, my name is Adam Smith. Uh, I'd like to speak on item five in general public comment. One minute for the item and one minute for general public comment. You may begin. Great, thank you so much. Um, I agree with callers today asking you to pass this FEMA motion urgently. Our city's response to this pandemic has been terrible. And we know that poor and working class Angelinos of color have bore the brunt um, of this pandemic. And the pandemic has, of course, shown the systemic inequities inherent to living under capitalism. Um, elected officials that run and want to speak to their constituents should do so. And the voices of those of most impacted by wealth and racial inequality should be centered, not ignored. Um, commandeer hotels, prioritize house with Angel Angelinos and those most rent burdened. We need housing and things that can act as housing, something congregate shelters can never do. Yes, you should push the FEMA motion to be uh, voted on at council on Tuesday, but if our council president hadn't unilaterally canceled Friday meetings 11 months ago against the city charter, items like this could be acted on even more urgently. And I ask that this committee, with the work that you are here to do, push council president Martinez to stop violating the city charter and start meeting on Fridays immediately. Uh, I wrote a song about it. I hope you all listen to it intently and love it. Um, unless you're Joe Bustaino, who I don't really give a shit about. Cheers. Next speaker, please. Caller with the last four numbers also ending in 9204. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi, my name is Maggie, and I am calling to speak on items five and general public comment. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general public comment. You may begin. Uh, like all our callers, I just want to strongly encourage you to act with urgency on making use of these FEMA funds and unused funds cut from the LAPD budget to house those living and dying on our streets every day. I've been calling to these city council meetings for quite a while now. When I started, there were three unhoused people dying per day on the streets, and now that number is nearly six. This is directly related to the lack of urgency, compassion, and vision displayed by this committee. Things are only going to get worse, and the blood continues to be on your hands. Please pass through this co pass this through the COVID committee and bring to the council a vote on Tuesday um, so that we can move quickly on housing our unhoused residents. Um, I'm going to move on to general public comment. I just want to address what the caller who called in support of Sweep said. It's true that trash is an issue, but they've created a false dichotomy where our only options are violent and invasive sweeps, and allowing trash to build up on the streets. 
The city could easily provide dumpsters and trash pickup for encampments. They could easily provide safe places to use the bathroom and shower, which would give Joey Buckets a break from harping about human waste. The Westchester Recreation Park literally has full shower and bathroom facilities right in the park, which remain locked because apparently people would rather no one use them than make them available to the dozens of unhoused people sheltering in the park. Or better yet, we can make use of the thousands of empty hotel rooms and housing units in the city to actually house people rather than allowing them to live on the street at all. There are so many solutions for keeping our streets safe and usable for everyone, and care suites just are not it. It's been shown time and time again. Unhoused people don't like them. The CDC says they're a bad idea during COVID. Like, I don't know why we have to have this conversation literally constantly about something that is so obviously not working. Thank you. I yield the rest of my time. We thank you for your testimony. We'll take the next caller. Caller with the last four numbers ending in 5137. Please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Good morning, committee. Um, this is Jamie Penn. I'm the socialist who's the Subdistrict 3 resident representative for the Wilshire Center Koreatown Neighborhood Council. My pronouns are she, her. I'd like to speak on all items and general public comment. You have all right. two minutes and one minute for general public comment. You may begin. Thank you so much. Um, so on item number one, the motion to align the Governor's uh, Council of Regional Homeless Advisors Comprehensive Crisis Response Strategy and create a goal to the right of housing. I am so thrilled to see a right to housing and thank you so much to my own representative uh, councilman, Mark Ridley Thomas. Um, the only concern that I have is the involvement with HCID. Um, I myself once reported illegal targeted displacement and even testified as a federal witness. Uh, in my experience, um, HCID agency is just not consistent and reliable for follow through. Um, a lot of my initial reports were unheard and were not responded to until I was involved with legal counsel. And this makes me very wary of their ability and willingness to stand up for marginalized Angelinos who would depend on the establishment of housing as a human right the most. Uh, for item number two, uh, reports for tax exempt status um, for the Sun Valley Senior Center uh, Veterans Apartments in the Old Canyon. Yes, please do it. Item number three, tax exempt status for Serenity Park Apartment. That's a proposed support of housing for seniors in K-Town. Please do it. Those are my constituents. Item number four, tax exempt status for Talisa Apartments. Yes, 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 please, more supportive housing. Uh, item number five, now the report back on using the FEMA reimbursement. Um, I do want to just make it super clear to all of the people listening, those funds are retroactive. Uh, we actually had a $15 billion state surplus. Uh, and I know that LAPD actually had $150 million surplus last year. We should just house people and then find a way to get paid back since those funds are retroactive. Um, item number six, have LADT issue permits for safe parking. Yes, please, more programs like it and quit cracking down on RVs. Uh, item number seven, please report back on the feasibility of using the city-owned property. Yes, social housing, we cannot build our way out of this. Uh, item number seven, instruct the city to find money to purchase the Caltrans properties. Absolutely long overdue. Those houses have been sitting vacant for years. And then on item number nine, identify a site. Yes, this absolutely, uh, for CD4, seems like a better use of spending than those awful sheds they're trying to pass off as tiny homes over there by Echo Park Lake. Um, uh, I believe uh, that's it. Oh, item number 10, um, Measure H, outreach programs. Absolutely, just please, um, any outreach programs right now are absolutely needed. The the marginalized Angelinos, knows they're getting hard as hit. They're, they're, they need help. Um, and then item number 11, the sale of city-owned property to CD8. Um, yes, uh, that is something that I hope you table. I, I'm, I'm not sure that this yeah, is that something needed right now. Uh, yeah. But yes, um, thank you so much for your time. Um, I you. really support a lot of the work you're doing, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, and likewise. Um, we'll move to the next caller, please. Caller with the last four digits ending in 0914. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi, yeah, my name is Caleb Crowder. I'd like to speak on items five, six, eight, and uh, general public comment, please. You have two minutes <laughs> for the items and one minute for general public comment. You may begin. Great, thank you. For item number five, please, please pass this motion. I think Jamie was making some excellent points just a bit ago. 
about how we should really approach this and meet this with the urgency that's needed. Um, it is retroactive, as she was mentioning, so please act with urgency, but please do not use these funds to do anything other than the most efficient thing, which is a focus on acquiring hotels, focus on acquiring places that are not congregate. I know that's mentioned in the motion, but and there are many of us that are concerned a lot of these funds might get funneled into something else. So please make sure that when we're talking about housing right now that is for emergency, that we're thinking about it in an equitable way, especially considering that many of that house, much of that housing, um, all these hotels have already received funds for it. We all know it. You know it. Please hold these folks accountable. Um, I'm going to move on to item number six. This is great. I thought it was really awful that LADOT was trying to suggest that Canoga Park should have some sort of say, the neighborhood council should have a say over whether or not we're using these city owner, all the DOT owned property. So I think this is amazing. Put pressure on them. Take some of that power away from neighborhood councils who should absolutely not have it. Um, item number seven. Uh, no, I don't want to speak on that one. Just kidding. Item number eight. I think this is amazing. Yes, please acquire all these properties. We shouldn't have to be going through these wild processes or folks are having to commandeer spaces themselves, putting their lives on the line in the midst of a pandemic to acquire properties that we should already be proactively acquiring. If they are sitting vacant, if there are any vacancies, we have an emergency and a crisis on our hands that is not new. This has been building for decades. If there are vacant properties, acquire them. We keep asking you to do it. You have the political will and the public will from us to do it. Please, we give you the green light. Go ahead. Um, in terms of general public comment, I would say, just to hammer this home, like, commandeer the hotels. We are not interested in congregate shelter, and house folks are not interested in congregate shelter. It's a shame in the midst of this pandemic, folks are still entering it every day. We have relatively zero beds available across the county. So stop criminalizing folks. It is insane to me that we have SECs, SECZs, still operating right now. They shouldn't exist at all, but in the midst of a pandemic, it is insane to me that you still are doing this and exposing folks to this type of brutalization. So please, in that, I would encourage each and every one of you who have uh, some sort of bridge housing in your district, in this immediately. Put pressure on people. All right, thank you. We thank you for your testimony. We'll now take the next caller. Caller with the last four digits ending in 7161, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. General public comment. You have one minute. You may begin. Good morning. I am speaking in support of the city resuming Care Plus cleanups citywide. There is a silent majority in L.A. that is pleading with the city to resume cleanups. I am hesitant to give my name today because people with our viewpoint are being harassed and targeted for speaking up. I've heard the viewpoint that shelters and tiny homes don't provide dignity and shouldn't be a part of the solution. I strongly disagree. Of course the goal should be permanent supportive housing, but it will be years before there is enough. In the meantime, all, including the housed and unhoused, must do their part to ensure a safe and livable city for all. Sidewalks, parks, and the public right-of-way are completely unsafe and unusable. Human feces, needles, and biohazard waste are everywhere. Medieval diseases like dysentery and typhus are coming back from the dead. The situation is not sustainable or humane either for us or our unhoused neighbors. It's disappointing that as a homeowner, I am shamed for wanting a clean and safe neighborhood for my family as well as the unhoused. I am urging you to resume Care Plus cleanups immediately. They are vital to our entire city's health and well-being. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take the next caller, please. Caller with the last four digits ending in 9299. Please press Press star six to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hey, my name is Joanna. Um, I organize with Street Watch LA. Um, I guess so many people have spoken so finely on item five. I'd like to make general comment and then let's stick to item six and eight. You have two minutes for the items and one minute for general public comment. You may begin. Awesome, thank you. And I just first off want to shout out the true bravery of these so-called silent majority who are calling in and literally dog whistling for the same hatred against the disproportionately black and brown communities for what I would argue is centuries, but um, <clears throat> they also still refuse to learn what services not police actually mean. So that's cool. Um, start on item six. It's so ironic. Um, I really support establishing more safe parking what I don't understand is how you're simultaneously supporting a guilt video motion that will potentially displace hundreds of unhoused vehicle dwellers in the next month. 
So this means mothers, children, elders, <clears throat> people susceptible to COVID. Um, and I'm just wondering, so like, are those humans dispensable to you all? Because everyone except Nithya voted yes on that uh, motion. Have you ever checked how uh, the safe 24-hour parking map works and how inaccessible it is to unhoused people and how little 24-hour safe parking actually exists already? So just wondering if you actually care about those hundreds of folks that you're about to criminalize and um, MRT if you've you know, said hello to those folks. Um, and um, I guess item eight, um, Kevin, I really hope that you respect the self and collective determination um, of the reclaimers, the unhoused mothers and families, um, avoid saviorism and give those people decision-making power as you move forward in this process. Um, general public comment. Um, again, yeah, applauding the silent majority who literally are using the same language of white supremacists from the 40s and 50s. We talk a lot about what isn't working and um, people seem really reluctant to actually speak to to what needs to change. Um, no one answered Nithya's question last meeting about harm reduction. No one in Lhasa. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering when you will agree to, to support those folks who are the most vulnerable in this unprecedented opioid ed epidemic. Um, will you continue to let NIMBYs dictate policing over health care? The um, appropriate response to the poop and needles hysterics that we hear is to reinvest uh, policing funds in safe use and needle exchange sites, recognize that we need decriminalization now. Um, and in a larger healthcare discussion, I think we also need access to vaccination. We understand that vaccines are, of course, becoming less and less accessible to black and brown communities and working class communities. So that includes our unhoused neighbors, and we need you to be prioritizing that vaccine outreach over shit like criminalizing vehicle dwellers right now. So just please keep those folks in mind. Um, that's it. Thank you. We appreciate your testimony. We'll take the next caller. Caller with the last four numbers ending in 0240, please press star six to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi, this is uh, John Parks and I'd like to speak on item number one. You have one minute. You may begin. Uh, my name is John Parks with the Coalition for Economic Survival. Uh, CES fully supports the right to housing motion and thanks Council Member Ridley Thomas for introducing this along with your colleagues. It is high time that Los Angeles followed the international community in recognizing that housing should be a human right for all community members. The housing and homelessness crisis has reached a breaking point as more folks fall into the cycle of homelessness in the midst of this pandemic. This motion is a good step forward, but the city council must take concrete steps to create a tenable implementation plan from the facts and research contained within the comprehensive crisis response strategy to truly and quickly ensure people's right to housing. Thanks so much. I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you for your testimony. We'll take the next caller. Caller with the last four digits ending in 1984. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Good morning. I'm calling on item number one five in general public comment. You have two minutes for the items and one minute for general public comment. Maybe begin. Thank you. Good morning. I'm uh, calling in support of item number one, and I'm also calling on behalf of the Hotel Association of Los Angeles, representing the hotel and lodging community. We stand firmly in support of Project Room Key and the expansion of the program to provide shelter to unhoused Angelinos. The greater hotel community has been a willing partner in Project Room Key since February of 2020 when hotels and motels representing more than 30,000 rooms expressed interest in participating in the program. Hoteliers continue to remain open and interest in the evolution of this program as it transitions to Project Home Key. And at this time, we ask the city to resolve one of the biggest roadblocks to program success and use the additional FEMA money to support third-party organizations providing the necessary wraparound services to ensure the well-being of individuals participating in the program. In many cases, the program has not had enough medical, mental, and health professionals and food service programs to support the thousands of individuals the county and city would like to engage, thus stalling the program. A hotel's core function is to provide temporary shelter in a caring and generous way, and as Project Room Key and Project Home Key advance, we look forward to successful partnerships with local governments 
to provide shelter for those in need. Thank you. We thank you for your testimony. We'll take the next caller. Caller with the last four digits ending in 9840, please press star six to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. My name is Brad Kane. Uh, I'm the president of the South Park Bay Neighborhood Association, the Pico Neighborhood Council. The views I'm expressing are solely my own. I want to speak on items one to five and general public comment. Uh, strongly support For uh, item one. Item one on the agenda, I think it's necessary. Uh, unfortunately, I think the city uh, bureaucracy is somewhat resistant and we need to move this forward as quickly as possible. On item number five, um, I think that the focus on using hotels and motels for Project Lunky is great, but I think it is somewhat limited. We have an enormous available stock of unused uh, apartments. They are the luxury dwellings that have been built under the TOC program, SB 1818. Many in my community where we have homelessness growing in encampments can see buildings that are half occupied or less. They got a benefit from the community to be much bigger than they should have been. So now I think it's time to look at requisitioning that space if, because they have not lowered the rents in at least two years. They're 5000 a month for a two-bedroom. No one can afford it. So since we can't do a vacancy tax, apparently, or it's going to be sometime down the road, can we talk about this and maybe they'll lower the rent so more people have places to go? Finally, uh, I just want to mention in the form of general public comment that I published an article with Dick Plotkin on a number of proposed ideas that are small bore but could move things forward because we have more people dying from homelessness than homicide right now in the city of LA. One of the items in there is, okay, if we want to provide a roof and a door for people, that's individual, we could bring in temporary transitional housing like tents in public parks, in closed shopping malls. We have the ability to do this, whether or not it complies with the judge's injunction, we need to do it on a mandatory basis now. Thank you very much. I can see the rest of my time. We thank you for your testimony, and we will take the next uh, speaker, um, which will likely be uh, our final speaker. Proceed, please. Caller with the last four digits ending in 6068, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi, yeah, this is Rishi Serjanko from People City Council. Uh, what a treat. I'm able to be the last one. Um, I'd like to speak on 5-7 in general public comment, please. You have two minutes for the items and one minute for general public comment. You may begin. Yeah, so, so oh, excuse me, I'm at number eight instead of number seven. So, number eight, um, you know, I fully support um, Kevin DeLeon uh, using underutilized city-owned property or state-owned property for housing options. Uh, um, I want to agree with what Joanna said earlier. Um, the reclaimers um, deserve agency o over what is going to happen with those houses in, the, in their community. Um, KDL, this seems like something that you actually want to take a stand for. Um, so I'd like to see you pursue it um, in the best way possible. And, you know, and to the point of using underutilized city-owned property, um, you know, that ties into item number five about uh, the report back on using FEMA reimbursement to expand non-congregate uh, shelter options. You know, this is, they were in an emergency, and, and, you know, I appreciate this being being pushed forward, and we are encouraging the, the committee to pass this motion, but ensure that it is met with the urgency that this crisis requires. Um, it should be waived through the COVID committee and sent to the full city council for a vote next Tuesday. If you saw the, the numbers from January, um, five and a half unhoused people died in Los Angeles per day. We are 10 months into this. And fortunately, we have people like MRT, KDL, Councilman Rahman on this council that, that seem to actually care about figuring out solutions for this crisis. And every single homelessness and poverty agenda should look like this. It's encouraging to see a committee ready to pass solutions rather than argue about criminalization and policies that waste our time. Like, like Joe Bustaino, I mean, everyone else here seems to be a pretty good person. Joe Buffett, you know, 
no one really likes you, buddy. Um, and, and MRT, you know, I, I spoke to your friend Jeff Cohen, and he said, you know, it uh, used to be a radical Marxist. And, you know, this is a, this is a perfect situation uh, to, to view through the lens of Marxism and uh, how capitalism is failing us, how it has failed the people of Los Angeles, how we have wound up to a place where we have 40,000 unhoused people living on the streets. And we're 10 months into this pandemic, and we need to seize the, hell, the, the hotels. FEMA will reimburse the city. And if you're worried about where the money is going to come from right now, I have a solution for you. That $150 million that you were going to take away from LAPD last year, take that. And guess what? LAPD also had $150 million surplus last year. So take that. And go as far as the police do not keep us safe. I know that everyone on this committee knows that and believes that, except for Joe Bucket, because you're a fucking cop. All cops are bastards. Um, but everyone else understands that the police do not keep us safe. So we should right. defund the Thank and you, sir. Right. right. Thank you for agreeing, MRT. I believe in you. All right. Thank you very much for your uh, testimony. Um, I'm, I'm pleased that I did announce um, initially that that was the final speaker. Uh, it had nothing to do with the content of his remarks and his attempt to out me in terms of my uh, uh, ideological credentials. Um, I uh, thank him very much, but I will be talking with Jeff Cohen uh, and straightening him out. Uh, uh, he invokes a name of from some 30, 40 years ago. Uh, long live uh, the memory of Jeff Cohen. Madam uh, City uh, Clerk, uh, what's before us before I uh, become completely disoriented? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, Mr. Clair Mr. Chair, that completes uh, public comment. So, um, what what is Whatever the committee was. Uh, Madam City Clerk, uh, you're muted. Uh, I, I, we didn't mean to wreck the meeting. That was just an intervention of um, uh, some consequence. Um, we'll get back on track momentarily here. Uh, I apologize, Mr. Chair. Um, that's, that's quite all right. Uh, it wasn't Das Kapital. Go ahead. Go right ahead. So at this point, we have concluded public comment. Um, is, are there items that the Chair or the committee would like to take on consent? It would be appropriate to do that now. All right. Uh, the, cons the consent calendar is before us. Uh, Madam, uh, I mean, members of the committee, um, uh, and uh, I'm prepared to move uh, items 2 through 4, 6 through 11. Um, and uh, we will leave items uh, 1 and 5 to be discussed by the committee in its totality. I see the hand of... Uh, uh, yes. Council Member Rahman. Yeah, I had a quick addition or amendment to item 10, which is my um, um, motion around um, outreach, if that's, if that's all right. Uh, please proceed, uh, Madam Council Member. Um, so I, uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, I introduced this motion... Uh, at the, on my first day in council, and since then have had a little bit more experience trying to work with LASA and with other outreach organizations in the district to see how we can work on filling some of the gaps that I know we have in outreach. Um, and I want to be as effective as possible in doing that, but we are we found that there are some limitations in data sharing. And I know that the motion talks about data sharing, but I just wanted to get a little bit more explicit information from LASA, if possible, on um, details about the data points that LASA is collecting through their outreach activities, which of those data points are or are not shared with the city, the legal barriers they're facing in collecting, in sharing that information with the city, and any recommendations they might have for future, da future data sharing practices which can improve the coordination of services. And I really want to be cautious here that um, I do really want to safeguard the privacy of individuals. I'm very, very conscious of that. And to make sure that any data shared with the city is not used for greater surveillance or for law enforcement or criminalization in any way, I really just want to hear from LASA on how, um, you know, what they feel like data sharing practices could look like that could really improve coordination because I feel like I want to be helpful, but there are some limitations in kind of information sharing that are preventing me from being helpful through the office. 
Thank you very much. Um, uh, the matter remains on co consent. Members of the committee, uh, permit the chair to just read the language of the amendment, uh, Lassa, to specify every kind of data. Mr. Chair? Lips. Yes. If I can, Ms. Raman, are you, I mean, we've, we've struggled over the years with uh, the Lassa not being able to move on real-time data. Is that included in, in, in your, your motion here? Uh, mm -hmm. not um, that is a, uh, I think that's a specific, that's a part of um, Councilmember Rodriguez's report back on the first motion. Very good. Thank yeah. you. All right. Uh, so that the committee is clear and the clerk will establish it is essentially to have Lassa to specify every kind of uh, data it collects, uh, which... Of uh, those categories it shares with the city, which of those it does not, and the legal justification for those categories. Additionally, Lhasa to speak a uh, report back on how this data might be more effectively shared with council offices for the coordination of homeless uh, services, uh, understanding the need to protect privacy and not have any of it used for law enforcement purposes. End of quote. That is the uh, amendment uh, that is being submitted by uh, Council Member Rahman on item number 10. Are there any other amendments to the items before us? Uh, Madam Clerk, would you uh, please read the consent items into the record before we cast our votes? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Um, we will start with item number two. This is a... Right. A city administrative officer and Los Angeles Housing and Community Investment Department reports relative to a request for authority to reissue tax exempt multifamily conduit revenue bonds for the San Diego Senior Veterans Department project located at 9041 North Laurel Canyon Boulevard and 12505 to 12515 West Jerome Street. Item number three is a CAO report and uh, Los Angeles Housing and Community Investment Department report relative to a request for authority to issue tax-exempt multifamily conduit revenue bonds for Serenity Apartments, a project located at 923 to 935 South Kenmore Avenue. Item number four is a CAO report and Los Angeles Housing and Community Investment Department report relative to a request for authority to issue a tax-exempt multifamily conduit revenue bonds for Talisa Apartments project located at 9502 North Van Nuys Boulevard. Item number six is a motion, Blumenfield, Bonn, and Gregorian et al. relative to issuing permits to any safe parking project on LA DOT property and to make necessary administrative changes including amending the LA Municipal and or administrative code to provide that the use of a parking lot as a safe parking program or, any, or for any other homeless program or project shall not be subject to the approval of the Board of Transportation Commission and related matters. Item number seven is a motion by Council Member De Leon and Ramen relative to the underutilization of city owned properties and the feasibility of using those properties for temporary or permanent homeless housing. Um, please note that on January 21st, 2021, the Information Technology and General Services Committee approved the motion as amended. Um, item number eight is a motion, De Leon Martinez, relative to the available funding sources to lease, conduct community outreach, and eventually purchase all property acquired by Caltrans for the 710 North Freeway Extension Project identified as suitable for housing and other community uses and as further instructed in the motion. Um, item number nine is a motion, Raman Krikorian, relative to identifying suitable sites and funding options within 45 days for a navigation center to deliver homeless services to be located in Council District 4. And finally, item number 11 is a city attorney report. Oh, I apologize. Let's skip number, item number 10. Um, as, as amended by Council Member Raman, this is a motion, Raman Martinez, relative to a report on the status of Measure H outreach programs in Los Angeles and all city funded outreach contracts and services carried out by either the county, LASA, or the city. And finally, item number 11 is a city attorney report in draft ordinance relative to authorizing the sale of the property located at 6527 Crenshaw Boulevard to Depot Hyde Park Partners LP, a California limited partnership. 
that concludes the reading of the items on the consent calendar, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, they're now teed up uh, to uh, be acted upon. Uh, is there a motion to move the um, consent? Move the items, Mr. Chair. Properly moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you very kindly. Uh, Madam uh, Clerk, would you uh, call the roll on the matter the item before us? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, Council Member Ridley Thomas is chair. Aye. Council Member De Leon. Aye. Thank you, sir. Council Member Buscaino. Aye. Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. And Council Member Raman. Aye. That's a, a, a majority or a, the motion passed. The, 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 the matters move forward, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Madam City uh, Clerk. It's unanimous. We will now proceed to the balance of the agenda. Um, uh, we have um, the two substantive uh, items more substantive than um, um, last week as a continuation of last week. Um, uh, the discussion that we started on January the 28th, uh, as you may recall, we had a presentation on the, the broad elements of the comprehensive crisis response um, a strategy to homelessness. And, we talked about them being in four different categories, prevention, interim housing, permanent housing, street engagement, uh, to uh, assist our unhoused residents. And, of course, we had to that supportive uh, services, uh, which are effectively embedded in each of the aforementioned components. Uh, now, the presentation is available uh, in the council file. Uh, and after the presentation, um, Committee members posed questions, and I noted that those questions would be answered at this meeting. Um, and these questions are part of um, what I would hope to be an honest, direct conversation that is necessary in order to improve how we assist our unhoused uh, neighbors and ultimately move in the direction of providing the right to housing. Uh, the questions today reveal that. Um, uh, it will take a significant amount of work to accomplish that, to uh, set in place that framework, the framework uh, for a jurisdiction to take progressive steps to adopt legislative, administrative, judicial, and budgetary measures to advance this right to housing. So this is not um, philosophical, it's not ideological, it's very practical in terms of what uh, must be done, and we trust that we can move in that direction. There are essentially seven elements that we think of when we talk about the right to housing, uh, security of tenure, availability of services and infrastructure, affordability, habitability, accessibility, location, and, might I say, cultural adequacy or competency. And so uh, should we be successful in moving this forward, uh, this framework, um, I think uh, we will have much uh, to celebrate in so doing. So item number one is to uh, conclude with the questions that members of the committee pose, uh, move forward uh, the uh, right to housing uh, piece of the motion and uh, be uh, prepared to uh, proceed accordingly. Um, and so that's uh, what we will do. Um, then we'll move to item number uh, five. Um, so we have Ann Sewell uh, back by popular demand. Phil Ansel, uh, Gary uh, Say, um, Heidi Marston, uh, Meg Barkley, John Wickham, and uh, maybe even more. Um, if that uh, caller were to... Uh, re-enter the conversation. He may even uh, bring up persons from your past who were involved in other uh, pursuits that um, you didn't think we knew about. Thank you so much. Um, here we are. So, Mr. De Leon, Mr. Vice 
the chair, you pose a question to Ann Sewell. She's ready to respond. We'll proceed with Ms. Rahman, her questions, Ms. Rodriguez, Mr. Buscaino, um, had a couple of questions, and that is the manner in which we proceed. Uh, Ms. Uh, Sewell, would you proceed? Uh, and Mr. De Leon, uh, if there's refinement uh, to the question uh, after she um, answers, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, Thank you, Ms. Sewell. Sure. Yeah. Thank you and good morning, um, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Um, so the question, as helpfully emailed out um, by the Chief Legislative Analyst Office, was um, about the leveraging of funding. And if we hadn't leveraged funding, I had commented that if we, um, on the HHH funds um, that are out the door already, if we hadn't leveraged, instead of being over 10,000 units, we would be at 3,000. And so the first part of the question was, please explain that logic. And, you know, so it, it was um, basically uh, just a, a math calculation. The average HHH subsidy per unit is about 135,000 right now, and there are 7,961 units in the pipeline. So I simply took 135,000 times 7,961, which meant that we have about 1 billion, uh, 74 million co committed to those units um, collectively. And then if I looked at the projects where we are doing no leveraging, simply um, providing city subsidy, and our only real example of that um, in the last year has been the Project Home Key projects where we re um, use our coronavirus money some from the state with our own money. Um, and, and the average subsidy on those was about 376000 out the door. So just divided that $1 billion by the 376 and came up with 2,851 units. So some more specific level. Now, we have, um, you know, we talked last week about in the pipeline, we have about 29 HHH projects that will probably not start construction this year, but in the next year, we have 306 units. And if we took the money that's committed to those and put it into non-leveraged projects, we'd get about 683 units instead of 1906. So hopefully it's not, it was not a, a really sophisticated calculation. It was just, you know, basically looking at what, what we've put into things where we haven't leveraged and, and how much money it's going to take. Um, the big advantage to not leveraging is you do bring the cost down because you, um, you aren't paying for the extra time that it takes to seek all those extra sources. And sometimes those extra sources ask you to ask us to do things that we wouldn't do, some of which are not bad things. For example, the state tax credit allocation committee makes us put in additional energy efficiency into projects that exceed what our general goals would be. This makes the projects more effective to operate and more efficient over time and, and save money over time. Um, so it's not that it's always stuff that we, you know, think is wasted money, but it does add to the money, and it's, it, but the net gain um, has usually been positive, or has always been positive. So the other part of the question was, was harder, <laughs> which is what, like, does it make sense to support housing? And I think the answer to that, thing, there isn't like a, um, you know, I think it should always only cost, you know, 250000 or 500 or whatever it is, I think you have to look at what is it cost in the market to build an apartment building right now and be realistic about, you know, costs. From the day HHH passed, we had people coming forward saying something could be done for, you know, 250000 a unit. They didn't ever say, I have just completed a building and it actually only costs 250000 a unit. And we never really saw any actual... Um, developers with with real numbers around that so we, we did we do from time to time go out we've worked with the Turner Center up at Berkeley who's done a study on costs and it's really hard to get market rate developers who don't have to share their costs with anybody they're not being audited by the city as we do with HHH projects um, but it's it's hard to get them but occasionally you know, a friendly developer with some, you know arm twisting will share share project costs so we looked at the costs of a couple of um, TOC projects that had gone through recently, um, and and we came up with 
um, in a report that I provided to the Citizens Oversight Committee, which I'm happy to share, um, that most of those projects were coming in at about $460,000 a unit. And when you adjusted for um, three things that really add to the cost of any city affordable housing project, whether HHH or something else, almost always we require prevailing wage. And in some cases we require, require beyond prevailing wage a project labor agreement. We also mostly require reserves. Most of these projects are going to be running really tightly on cash flow because their rents will be restricted forever or for 55 years. And so they're not, you know, one uh, pandemic with tenants who can't afford to pay rent and, you know, you need some reserves that, that will not build up naturally over time. And we also um, pay developer fees, which are not paid in market rate projects because Developers in market rate projects earn their fees when they sell the projects, usually two to three years after um, stabilized occupancy. So, so I think the real thing, you know, we look for what's reasonable in the market and then um, how can we make sure that we are not adding to the cost with city, with additional city requirements that we have, that haven't really come before you. Prevailing wages was a conscious decision that we made. Um, and, and, you know, those other costs were conscious decisions, but sometimes we accidentally add things like replacement parking on city-owned sites or other requirements that we really want to explore, um, making sure that we're not adding costs. So the final part of the question was, um, how do development variables such as land costs and development soft costs factor into deciding, I guess, what's a reasonable cost? And, you know, land costs are really the, about trying to push density as high as we can go because, you know, the more units per parcel of land, the cheaper the cost. On HHH projects, typically land is running between forty-five and 65000 a unit. Um, it varies. Um, and we are finding with the passage of um, AB 1197 two years ago that gave a CEQA exemption to our HHH projects that developers really are finally able to take advantage of their... Um, a density, uh, the ability to use higher densities in our permanent supportive housing zoning ordinance without fear of, of being sued under CEQA. Um, so uh, the, the soft costs, um, you know, as I said, the major one that you see in supportive housing that you don't see in other projects are developer fees embedded in the total development cost and because of the multiple financing sources in the longer period of time you can see soft costs like holding costs go up. So, I, Council Member De Leon, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but happy to answer any more. Yeah, no, thank you very much, um, and I, I appreciate the comprehensive sort of analysis. And, and uh, through the chair, less of a question and, and more so a, a commentary, because I think we can actually spend many, many hours going point by point and, and counterpoint. And, and I surely want to, don't want to do that. I, I respect. Uh, your knowledge when it comes to housing and when it comes to financing, blended financing, stacked financing, um, and surely you know much more than you've forgotten more than, than I actually know in totality, in totality when it comes to you know financing and, 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 and housing, uh, particularly in, in the nonprofit sector. A couple of things I want to say is that, and this is not to, to pit market versus five hundred one c three social mission driven development with regards to the, the crises that we're uh, uh, experiencing, all of us, you know, together as, as council members, as, as community members of, of the great city of Los Angeles. Uh, I, I do believe that the, the current stacked, blended model system that we currently have is, is, is severely outdated. Um, and it, it, it drives costs still. And I maintain that. And that's why I don't want to respect everyone's time uh, because we can be – at this for a very, very long time uh, discussing this point. And it, it delays costs, it, I should say increases costs exorbitantly, and it delays construction uh, when we have the tax credit system. And when you're stacking it, when you're blending it, 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 it takes an awful long time. And the point is, because sometimes, uh, you know, I, I, the other day I was thinking, wow, I kind of sound like a, a, a budgetary fiscal, you know, hawk you know, or conservative in my perspective with regards to dollars and cents. And the only reason why I, I emphasize and overly emphasize this is that we have a, a certain amount of dollars, and the dollars that we have, we have to stretch them uh, to the best of our ability, and that requires some innovative, creative, 
ways of, of, of financing, how we figure the, that, that out, uh, dealing with the, the magnitude of the crisis that we have today, you know, on our streets uh, in, in, in every district that we have uh, in, in the city of L.A. And, and how we figure that out um, in the future, I think is going to be really critical. And, and it's not just an issue with regards to, to building, you know, whether it's tr the traditional uh, apartment style uh, building, building or what's prefabricated modular or what's container, but it's also to, and I think that, you know, Councilman Rahman is really pushing his hard to her credit the issue of how do we take room key and convert that to home key, you know, temporary shelter to permanent shelter and acquiring, you know, distressed fixed assets that folks who, who hold that note right now may be in over their head because the lack of, of, of tourism, the lack of folks that are patronizing these very distressed fixed assets during a COVID uh, pandemic uh, period. You know, how do we do scatter site, you know, approach, well, how we engage with our, our friends in Congress to up their game up uh, to deal with the, the lack of Section 8 voucher housing uh, increases uh, that hasn't happened in, in, in decades. You know, how we deal, you know, with the acquisition, the, the fancy vernacular that is City Hall, I guess they call it redaptive reuse or adaptive reuse, which is just purchasing a building and converting it, you know, for housing sooner rather than later and, and, and figuring all this stuff out. Um, surely, I appreciate, you know, obviously your time and, and coming back. And I'd love to sit down with you as well as your staff uh, in the immediate future to figure out how we can figure out figure out together collectively uh, much more innovative, efficient ways and what we can do. And I think I said this last time, too. And I don't know if I said it to the council as a whole when you were there, and or if it was uh, through the chair at the last uh, committee hearing. Um, what is it that we do um, collectively that gets in the way of um, building sooner rather than later and building efficiently value uh, for volume? And what can we make, what changes can we make internally? Um, and the sort of kind of novel idea, for example, of having LADWP, LA Fire Department, uh, Building and Safety, um, Planning Department, and, and various other departments do something that may be, you know, uh, a cutting edge, which is actually picking up the phone and communicating and talking with each other, as opposed to the, the siloed sort of, you know, individual domains and how we can sort of compress, if you will, vertically so we can be much more efficient, so we can put product, because ultimately, at the end of the day, we don't have that luxury with people who are dying on the streets, people who are caught up in the, the elements of the extreme weather patterns, uh, people uh, uh, we need to uh, put them, obviously, in non uh temporary shelter so we can move them into that permanent site. And, and obviously, you have one of the, you're one of the most experienced individuals that we have not just in L.A., but obviously in, in the state of California. So I look forward to sitting down with you and your staff to see how we can sort of kind of brain, burn a lot of brain cells to, to figure out some paradigm shifts that I think are necessary if we collectively, through this committee and as a council as a whole, and just as individual citizens, you know, no titles, just as individual citizens who care deeply about the issue of, of homelessness, how we can make it a huge impact because we have to, you know, sooner rather than later. But I appreciate your, your comments. All right, thank you very much, Mr. De Leon. Uh, let the record reflect that uh, um, Mr. De Leon represented himself in his discourse as a self-acclaimed fiscal conservative. All right, let's pro proceed to the next uh, item at hand, uh, which is uh, Council Member Rahman. Uh, several uh, persons wishes, uh, wish to respond to your uh, questions. Uh, Phil Ansel, Gary uh, Sette, um, Heidi Marston, uh, addressing uh, the substance use uh, services that are funded. And then um, uh, the additional question that was posed by Council Member Rahman uh, was um, uh, is going to be answered by both Heidi and Victor. Um, what are the preferred lines of communication for disseminating homeless encampment information? And so uh, let's go at all of that and uh, address uh, the Council Member's questions. If there are refinements, uh, Ms. Rahman, uh, feel free uh, to weigh in. Uh, the questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen, on the line who are listeners, callers, are uh, posted on the council file. All of the questions for 
your benefit. Let's proceed with Mr. Ansel in response to Council Member Rahman's question. Um, good morning, um, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Rahman, thanks for having us back. I would actually like to uh, defer to Dr. Gary Sai, who's the Director of uh, Substance Abuse Prevention and Control for the County's Department of Public Health and is um, the county expert uh, on this specific question. All right, thank you so much. Let the record reflect that for the first time in history, uh, Mr. Ansel deferred to someone else. Mr. Sai, please proceed. <laughs> Uh, very grateful to be a part of history today. Um, <laughs> I understand that um, Councilmember Rahman had questions around substance use services and specifically how they were funded, what institutions were responsible, um, and also where the dollars are coming from to support these services. And so um, just broadly, um, I'll organize this uh, via the public sector and then the private sector. So on the private sector side, I'm referring to, um, you know, private insurers and health plans um, that do have responsibilities around providing uh, substance use services. And there was recent legislation, SB 855, that focused on uh, ensuring parity um, of those private insurers, in addition to all of the other parity uh, legislation that had already um, existed. And so um, on the public side, which is what the uh, Department of Public Health Substance Abuse Prevention and Control, or SAPC, is responsible for, um, we have a, a number of different funding streams. Our two main funding streams are uh, 2011 realignment, uh, and then the uh, Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grant, which are federal dollars. Um, the other funding that we receive and categorize as our intra-fund transfers are essentially the funding that other uh, departments and entities are responsible for, but which we receive a portion of. So those include things like AB 109, General Relief, CalWORKs, um, et cetera. And so um, those are the main funding sources. As you probably know, uh, realignment, which is one of our main funding sources, is funded through uh, vehicle license fees and sales tax at the state level. And uh, the county receives a certain allocation um, based off those revenues at the state level to help support services. Um, there's also a, a 1991 realignment, which um, we don't receive on the substance use side, but which um, Department of Mental Health also has access to, just to kind of differentiate between the different types of uh, realignment. Um, on the federal block grant side, um, you know, those funds are used to fu fund both prevention as well as treatment services. There's a certain amount that we receive um, that's discretionary that we can use towards treatment, um, although there's a minimum amount of 20% that we use towards prevention, and we're actually using higher amounts towards prevention um, given uh, our, our desire to prioritize uh, preventative services um, in comparison to treatment services. Um, the services that we fund that are not reimbursable through drug Medi-Cal, which is the carve-out within Medi-Cal for substance use services, um, those are things like recovery bridge housing, uh, room and board for residential treatment, uh, and also the local share. So one important point to make is that even for Medi-Cal reimbursable services, there's always a local share. And that local share or match is generally uh, anywhere from 10 to 50 percent, depending on the population. You know, whether someone was previously eligible prior to the Affordable Care Act for Medi-Cal or whether they're newly eligible, uh, which is essentially uh, the expansion population. And so um, the, the funding that we use to support those uh, are, you know, non-federal. So, for example, we can't use our block grant funds to support the non-federal share or the local match, but we use some of our other more flexible funding, such as uh, realignment. So that's the main way in which um, substance use services on the public side are funded. Um, it can, we can get much more detailed than that, but uh, I'll pause there just to see if that addresses the funding question. Madam Council Member. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sai. I just had a quick question. When you mentioned the prevention services, uh, what does that actually look like, and where can those services be accessed? 
Yeah, good question. Um, so we have a network of community-based uh, substance use prevention providers that essentially um, serve as community resources within their respective neighborhoods. So that's one aspect of our prevention services. Um, our block grant funds also support our uh, student well-being centers, which are the um, 50 or so uh, high schools across the county uh, that serve uh, vulnerable uh, youth, um, and you know they're delivering uh, substance use education uh, as well as some sexual health in, in partnership with um, with Planned Parenthood. Um, other prevention services include um, things like the our, our harm reduction providers or syringe exchange pr providers, and so they also receive. A portion of uh, those block grant funds. There are some limitations uh, with those federal funds with respect to actually purchasing needles, for example, but they can support other aspects of uh, syringe exchange. So when you talk about the community-based organizational effort, are you talking more about an educational campaign in terms of your prevention, in terms of what the prevention work looks like? So those are actually kind of brick and mortar sites where uh, pr substance use prevention staff are, are situated. They also go out into the community to do, it is kind of educational outreach type activity. Um, also, y your comment just uh, highlighted that I should also mention our prevention funds also help to support the various uh, media campaigns we've had around uh, opioids and methamphetamine, et cetera. Okay, and then on the treatment services side, those are distributed, there's either a, a service map of where we can access those throughout the entire county for uh, locally for referral, or how does, what does that network look like, and uh, how would it be best accessed? Yes. Um, so there are different ways to access. Um, one is we do have a service embed availability tool, otherwise known as the SBAT, that essentially is a filterable uh, map of all of our contract providers. Now, that's only for the pu public side. And I do think it's important that we kind of differentiate because there's different systems for that. Um, so on the public side, that allows a user to go through all of our services and essentially filter similar to how they would filter for a hotel on Expedia exactly what they're looking for and narrow down the list of our contract providers. Um, that is also available on our website. We have a substance abuse service helpline, also known as SASH, where someone can call in, um, and then they'll speak with an agent that's available 24-7 to link them with uh, a treatment agency. And then also the, th the third main way, there's actually two other ways. One is um, just direct to provider. Uh, a lot of the services that we receive, probably close to half, are just, you know, word of mouth, um, people in the community just hear about a, a location and they go directly there. Um, a, another uh, mechanism of access is through our client engagement navigation service, um, which are uh, staff who are situated at particular locations across the county, um, whether it's DCFS offices or some in hospitals that can do something similar to what the SASH is doing, except they're doing it in person. Can I get your, the website that you referenced about where they can identify the availability of beds and uh, treatment centers? Sure, no problem. I'll, I'll actually just, I think, post it in the chat if that's all right. Perfect. I think if we have the chat. Oh, yeah, perfect. And then also the phone number. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. You're more than welcome, uh, Council Member Rahman. Um, uh, were there additional was... questions you wanted to drill in uh, on? Well, yeah, I just had a question about kind of the barriers that you're facing in providing these services. Like, is the funding that you, funding options that you've outlined adequate? Do you have enough of the local share to be able to provide the kind of resources that you need to provide? Or are you, you know, looking for more resources, uh, more funding, more resources um, right now? So, um you know, obviously, like many uh, governmental departments, um, we have experienced some, some budget challenges as a result of the pandemic. Um, I would say that even more broadly, uh, though, um, back in 2017, we implemented the Drug Medi-Cal Organized Delivery System Waiver, or the DMCOES Waiver, which is really a, a generational opportunity to invest more 
into specialty substance use treatment systems um, to yield results and also essentially set our systems up so we can eventually better integrate care across those health and social service systems. Our funding prior to the drug Medi-Cal waiver and now post uh, DMCODS has not changed um, in terms of our revenue, I mean. And so since uh, we implemented in 2017, we have grown in terms of our sites and the services delivered through those sites. And so I, I can say that um, in order for us to achieve uh, the ultimate aim of the drug Medi-Cal waiver to really kind of view substance use as, you know, a um, equal uh, leg of the stool, so to speak, thinking about physical health, mental health, and substance use in particular, um, we will need to look at uh, funding and um, how we can support necessary growth on the substance use side with respect to our broader health system. Uh, uh, this is not obviously to say that our health and mental health partners don't need additional funding, but just to say that um, the whole purpose of the drug Medi-Cal waiver was to better invest uh, we've done that, um, but with those investments um, also come local matches because obviously the, the drug Medi-Cal waiver is a federal and state uh, waiver, uh, and they've invested more, and in, you know that comes with a local match component. So I do think that um, we'll need to be looking at a, the, our, our budget in order to support growth. All right, any more questions from Council Member Raman or any more responses uh, from... Um our panel, uh, Heidi, Victor, um, uh, Phil. Mr. Chairman, I, yes, thank you. I, I would like to add just two points um, to what Dr. Sai shared as it relates to homelessness. Um, first, I want to just um, underline one of the services that Dr. Sai mentioned, which is Recovery Bridge Housing, which is interim housing for people experiencing homelessness who are engaged in outpatient substance use disorder treatment. Most commonly, this is Recovery Bridge Housing serves people who have exited residential SUD treatment and now and are homeless and need a place to live while they uh, seek to sustain their recovery with the help of outpatient services. Um, so this this is an, a comparatively this is a category of SUD treatment services that has expanded substantially in Los Angeles County, um, largely through funding for Measure H. So the way to think about this relative to the broader homeless service delivery system is as a specialized category of interim housing um, serving this particular population. And there definitely is, um, there would be demand for additional recovery bridge housing if there were the funding for um, additional beds. Got it. And then, I'm sorry, excuse me. No, go ahead. I just said got it. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. And then the one other point is I, I, I think it might be helpful if Dr. Sai could just address the prevalence of people experiencing homelessness as they self-identify within the broader uh, SAPSI service population, given the focus of this committee and of today's conversation on homelessness. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so sorry, if I could just add a little bit, just one thing, since we're talking about it in the context of addressing homelessness and the outcome that we want to see in, in Los Angeles, um, I just would love to get a little bit more information about how you think about outcomes and what data about outcomes is shared with the broader ecosystem in terms of the work that you're doing. So I just wanted to add on to um, Mr. Ansel's uh, question. Yes, thank you. Um, and as I was focusing on the follow-up question, I, I'm now, uh, Phil, can you remind me? Yes, that, what, Gary, what's the prevalence of, among people getting SUD treatment, what percentage of people self-identify as homeless? Yeah, so when we look at our treatment data, um, to, you know, it varies year by year, but typically um, 25 to 30 percent of our patient population served within the specialty substance use system do self-identify as homeless. And so it is a, 
obviously a sizable portion of uh, our clients that we serve in our network. Uh, with respect to the follow-up question on um, outcomes, um, there is a national outcomes uh, database known as TEDS, a state database that includes the national as well as some state-specific data known as CalOMS. And then locally, we've actually built on top of CalOMS um, to include uh, data that we wanted. And, you know, what we focus on with respect to substance use uh, outcomes really uh, is around um, treatment engagement, um, you know, how uh, follow-up appointments, for example, if people are making follow-up appointments, um, also how long they're in treatment, you know, trying to differentiate between people who leave after two days because they've changed their mind or, um, you know, people who have gone through, you know, let's say, you know, 28 days or 30 days of treatment. Um, and then, um, you know, we try to also get at, although this is um, important to mention based off self-report, um, how their substance use treatment has impacted their mental health and or physical health conditions. Um, you know, obviously, it's based off self-report, and so it's not exactly tying systems together. Um, you know, we do uh, try to share information to the extent that we can. Uh, there are challenges, as you likely know, around um, not HIPAA, but actually the more restrictive confidentiality regulations that govern substance use, known as 42 CFR Part 2. And so oftentimes when we are able to coordinate, it involves others sending us data that we then match um, versus, you know, true information sharing where our data is going out. Um, there, have, there has been interest at the federal level in order to look at uh, both HIPAA as well as 42 CFR Part 2. And so, you know, there may be changes around that, but, you know, there are challenges that I think is important to acknowledge around information sharing. You're muted, Mr. Chair. You're muted. Uh, thank you. That's the nicest thing someone has said to me today. Nonetheless, um, um, I have one um, follow-up question, Mr. Chair, if I might. Please. Yes, I want. I want to make sure that uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Buto, I know, is heard, um, and uh, and 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 Ms. Rodriguez, in view of the fact that. Um, uh, Ms. Rahman owns this question, and you have several others. I want to make sure that I appropriately uh, uh, give her the airtime that she needs. Now, uh, Dr. Asai, you've uh, provoked a lot of questions here, um, and you came under the banner of, of SAPSI in the Department of Public Health. Members of the com uh, committee, I just wanted to be known that Dr. Uh, Asai is a, a psychiatrist. Uh, therefore... I guess I need to say nothing more about the questions that you pose. Just, just tread lightly. Thank you so much. Who's next? Uh, I hate to do that to you, but I needed to make it sure that everybody knows co-occurring disorder specialist. Bill, you didn't tell us that. You just kind of walked in, in under this committee, and here we are, uh, disclosing everything we know about ourselves before we even know it. All right, Mr. Buscaino, uh, you, Mr. floor is yours. Ms. Rahman, you're going to have an opportunity to wrap this up, and uh, Ms. Rodriguez, do what you do when you feel you need to do it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank Ms. Rahman for elevating this conversation here. Um, this feels like Groundhog Day. Over the years, we have the, this the issue of drug addiction, drug use, particularly within the encampments, based on uh, my knowledge and my experience and what I've seen firsthand on the ground in our um, encampments, um, our high-profile encampments, there's a significant amount of, of drug use taking place in these encampments, and um, we have seen and experienced throughout the city of Los Angeles um, a, a lot of overdoses. Also, we have seen clearly that there are drug dealers who are preying among the most vulnerable living uh, in these encampments, um, and I agree, Ms. Rama, we've got to be more, um, you know, uh, uh, focus heavily on outcomes, outcome driven. And I believe this is a breakdown. Based on what me, my, my, me and my team are seeing, Ms. Rahman and, and, and colleagues, is what happens is when we um, 
get into the encampments. We have the, sur the surf social service providers in there. Um, individuals who are homeless within these encampments, they do find their way into a substance abuse, a substance um, um, facility. But then after they detox, after 28, 48 hours, there's no way, no coordination uh, to make sure that the individuals, uh, homeless folks, don't go back into the encampment. And this is where the frustrations continue. Um, and this is the breakdown uh, and um, in, in communication and coordination, Dr. Sai, and I'm hopeful that, um, uh, you know, we, we elevate this and prioritize this with the, the focusing more on the coordination if we're going to help those, particularly those who are suffering from drug addiction and drug abuse. Thank you. Let me weigh in here at this point. This is a, a key point. This is a part of the safety net expansion agenda that we must embrace. Uh, it is essentially what yes. we have to do yes. when we talk about establishing uh, the uh, uh, kind of cutting edge facilities that we describe as sobering centers um, that do what they need to do uh, for persons who are in crises and get them on a path. If we want to talk about alternatives to incarceration, we need to build infrastructure, and a part of that infrastructure will be the psychiatric urgent care centers, will be the sobering centers, the behavioral health centers, the recuperative care centers. That's how we begin to do what we need to do, and it gives a, a tremendous opportunity for public sector and private sector um, a collaboration. It further um, accents the need for the kind of coordination between uh, the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles, the land use aspects of it and the safety net aspects of it. This is essentially uh, the thrust of what we have to move forward on in order to uh, celebrate progress in real terms. Very practical. Uh, it has fiscal implications yes. or consequences, but it's smarter than trying to maintain the status quo as we currently experience nothing but a downside attaching to what we do and i want to make it abundantly clear uh that this is a, a, a trauma-informed pursuit it is done through a health lens it is not uh led by law enforcement i want to make it abundantly clear right now that's a last resort option at best and we need to put first things first that's why you see um Dr. Sai speaking the language that he does in the manner that he does. Uh, and so I think this is very important. Your questions have been very useful. Um, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to yes. also yeah, in, in, intervene and say that the questions that I was asking around um, substance abuse or dependency resources really come from my experiences trying to assist individuals trying to get access to those resources and finding real barriers in getting those resources. Right. You know, right. and I think... For me, the real heart of this question is, you know, what are the obstacles that we're facing as we're trying to expand access to those services? How do we make sure um, that information about them is widely available? How do we make sure they're funded adequately? If there's funding blocks, then that we're addressing those blocks either through the resources of the city or requesting the state specifically to say these are the challenges that our city is facing as it's grappling with these issues. We want everyone who has a need for or an interest in securing these resources to be able to get them when they need them, when they need them. And I think that just hasn't been my experience in, in seeing how this has played out. And I, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to understand a little bit more about the landscape of this. Thank you. Indeed. The last thing I'll say on this is we just need more of the kinds of things that I just described. There's always going to be barriers uh, in part because people don't know where to go and there is no place to go um, that's immediately accessible. It needs to be uh, throughout communities uh, in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, so you do have um, not a shortage of centers to which I, I referred, but an adequate number to meet the need uh, of our population. And currently that isn't the case. And I'll, I'll say it as bluntly as I uh, am required to say it. We just simply need to get out of our own way and provide these resources in real time. Uh, they're smarter. They're more cost 
effective. Um, and more to be said about that uh, uh, when we uh, calendar those items. But I think uh, this is an opportunity for us to do extraordinarily important work. And I thank you for your uh, question, Council Member uh, Raman. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, uh, Council Member Rodriguez. Um, you pose a question to Lassa. Therefore, uh, Heidi Marston uh, is prepared to respond to you uh, accordingly. Uh, yeah. Heidi? Go ahead, go ahead, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. I just had one more for Dr. Sai, really quick, and I want Ms. Roman. Thank you so much because, and, and Mr. Ridley Thomas, to your point uh, about making these facilities more widely accessible and available, because there it, there is a communication gap in terms of how people can go about accessing that, and that's why I'm grateful for this uh, link uh, to even identify what beds might be available. But Dr. Sai, if you could assist. Uh, how often are these beds, the bed availability, for example, updated? Because even in my own backyard in my district, Phoenix House, they haven't updated their information since November 2019. So contractually, um, they're required to update it on at least a daily basis. Um, I do want to highlight that the, the different sites, um, you know, We've worked with them to try to uh, actually execute that, essentially. Um, and so there are certain sites that have had more challenges than others, to your point. Okay. Well, I, you know, this kind of goes back to, um, you know, uh, Ms. Raman, and just to underscore, and I'm so thankful, Mr. Ridley Thomas, for your uh, chairmanship of this committee, because it really is instrumental in our collaborative work with the county to have that accountability for the services that they're funded to provide, because we don't have uh, the funds that come from the state or the federal government for these types of services. And we can continue to ad advance investments in these areas, but again, we don't have, uh, without a health department, we don't have the recoverability mechanism for the investments that we make to that end. And so we need our government agencies and partners at the different levels to also uh, be accountable to making sure that these issues are addressed. So, um, again, my appreciation for this information, it was very, very helpful and insightful for me, and, and thank you, Ms. Raman, for asking those questions. Uh, and thank you, sir. Yes, I uh, also want to make reference to uh, at least four different dashboards. Uh, the city has a dashboard, the county has a dashboard, um, LASA has a dashboard and United Way has a dashboard that talks about uh, results, what's supposedly going on and what's being accomplished and they are publicly uh, accessible. Perhaps someone will take it upon themselves to drop those uh, links to those dashboards uh, in the chat. The point that I, I wish to make is uh, there's no replacement for transparency and accountability. Uh, so part of the committee's work, uh, Councilwoman Rodriguez, is to shine a light mm -hmm. on the issue of accountability, uh, to push for more collaboration between the city and the county. I believe that can happen, and if it does happen, uh, I think we will find ourselves uh, doing this uh, uh, quite effectively. Now, Madam Clerk, if you can uh, transmit the, the links that I just referenced to the council file, that will also be helpful. Um, Ms. Marston, you want to uh, respond to the concerns that we gave you from Ms. Rodriguez? Yes, absolutely. Good morning. Thanks for having me. And thank you, Council Member Rodriguez, for your, your questions about interim housing and specifically availability of the beds. So just as framing, and it, it fits well into this broad conversation, um, there are many different funders of interim housing across the system, right? So lots of funds and operate some of those sites. The county, you heard from Gary about SAPC having some beds. Um, health services has some mental health. So there's a broad array of stakeholders already who are kind of working together to um, create this infrastructure of interim housing. Um, so we have, because of the complexity of that, we have a countywide matching team, we call it, at LASA, and their job is to manage referrals that come in to those specific beds. So a lot of the beds that we have, with the exception of, like, winter shelter beds, for example, that are really walk-up sites, 
Um, many of our beds have requirements um, that you, you need to meet. So sometimes it's based on geography, sometimes mental health beds, right? You, you're, you need some sort of mental health support to be eligible for those beds. Health services has certain requirements. So our matchers take the information and the referrals that come in and, and work together with the county in partnership to match people to the right resource for them and to the right bed that's available. Um, but all that to say, we are also working collaborat collaboratively to bring together some sort of infrastructure that would give more real-time bed availability information um, that we know so many people are seeking. So um, that includes validating what our inventory is, uh, recognizing that not all of the inventory fits within LASA or the county. There's the privately funded shelters, too, so we're getting our arms around all of that and then creating a data infrastructure through our homeless management information system, HMIS, where providers will feed in the beds that are available from their sites. That will feed up into a broader portal and give us a sense that on a more real-time basis at, on what's available at any given time. Right now that kind of happens in pockets based on funders. So all of that is underway um, and is certainly something that we see as important. Um, we're also providing technical assistance to our providers to make sure that the data is getting in because our data on what we can report out is only as good as the data coming in. So making sure they have the capacity on site as they're operating these to keep that updated. Um, a couple other things I wanted to note, there are a select group of project home key sites. Um, some, some of our home key sites, as you know, are operating as interim housing initially. So we are going to roll out what we're calling a bed reservation feature through our HMIS system that really simplifies the process um, for providers. So they enter in their bed availability for those sites. Um, that will enhance the occupancy data that we can collect um, at a system level and then fill the bed as quickly as possible. Um, we're testing that feature now and are hoping to roll it out this month. Um, I think the other piece, other than the fact that all of our different programs have different layers of requirements between the mental health, health services, LASA, um, and even the type of interventions we fund, um, what we do see consistently is that all of our beds are consistently at high occupancy. So anywhere from 85 to 95% at any given time. But what we need to do is what you're saying is take that to the next step to make sure that's being, we're being transparent and that's being shown publicly so folks know that those resources are utilized. Um, one final example I'll give that we learned a lot is through the Project Room Key, where we had a centralized referral mechanism that people could call into to refer folks. Those sites filled up um, within days, stayed full, and our list, even at our peak when we had about 4,000 rooms, we had over 2,000 people waiting. So it speaks to the significant need. There are not enough beds to house everybody, and we know that. Um, but we we are working to bring that, that data and that IT uh, technology to make sure we're more transparent about it. Thank you, Heidi. And I'm excited about that bed reservation. That's great. And so at what point does that get released? For example, if, you know, once you make the reservation in terms of folks showing up or not showing up, how long is that held? Will, how long will that be held in the system before it's released and availed to uh, to others? That's part of why we're testing it right now because we're trying to find the sweet spot, and some of it is dependent on the provider and the site. Sometimes it's a 24 hour. Sometimes it's shorter if we know somebody's on their way. Um, if it's like a hospital discharge, for example, we might have a better way of knowing. So that's exactly what we're testing to see where um, where we should put that lever and um, when a hold should be released so we're not just holding empty beds. And with respect to the service providers uh, participating and giving you the availability of that, I know that's always, just as we just discovered right now with uh, the substance abuse, <coughs> you know, it's really incumbent upon them to provide that information and that data. So when you say that you're working on it, what's your timeline? What does it look like? So it's ongoing. We've been doing it. We're going to continue. Um, we're going to test it with this because I think even with this bed reservation system, it's going to give us an idea of the kind of staffing that's needed. I'll tell you right now, at least from the loss of perspective, our interim housing sites, um, all of their capacity for staffing is going to managing the site itself, the people coming in and out, making sure the safety of the residents is upheld, so they don't have that capacity to be doing the data entry that's required. So part of what we're going to be looking at is what would that take? Is it another person that needs to be funded where their, their sole job is to just input that? Is it 
on the LASA side that we need to call providers multiple times a day to get that. We don't know what that looks like yet, um, so this will help inform where that goes. So the next month or two, I mean, what in terms of? Yeah, we're testing in March, so I would say, you know, by spring we'll have at least some data to share about how that's going and whether we think it could be scaled. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Buscaino, you had a couple of questions, and we have those who are prepared to respond to them. We begin with uh, Ann Sewell uh, addressing Mr. Buscaino's questions, as well as Heidi Marston. Okay? Sure. Uh, good morning, um, council member. Uh, so, uh, Councilmember Busca, you know, I'll just go ahead and, and read your question unless you want to jump in. But um, okay, so oh, um, go ahead and read it so he'll remember it. Uh, <laughs> no, I got it. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, absolutely. You're going to do that. So uh, the first part was how do we ensure that the Bureau of Engineering and other city entities are not putting up roadblocks that prevent more private sector collaboration. Um, and then the second part, how should the city engage and leverage private sector investments, such as um, urban awnings to build housing? So um, I think the short answer is we should do a better job of ensuring that you know, all of the city entities um, don't put up roadblocks to prevent more private sector collaboration. Uh, you know, we, uh, uh, one of the things that we've been working on for the last four years, really, in the city has been streamlining the conveyor belt that each each possible project, whether it's an HHH project or a private sector project, has to go through to get, you know, the zoning entitlements, land use approval, you know, permits, um, all the way through and through my own department to get money and covenants and things like that signed off on. And it's a multi-month um, process that sometimes you know, involves taking a project and somebody approves it and then you take it to the next department and they say, oh, you can't possibly put that window there. Um, go back and, you know, uh, I mean, the, the most simple examples sometimes are in order to meet seismic requirements, you have to have a long stretch of plywood and in order to meet fire requirements, you need windows of a certain size to let a fireman with all his stuff on his back through through a bedroom window, and there are a lot of bedrooms where it's simply not possible to do both those things in the same room. So, so we have a lot of codes that are trying to meet very good requirements, and they 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 um, bump up against each other and need some some solutions. So, um, recently, you know, at about uh, two weeks ago, the uh, general managers of housing planning. Um, and uh, building and safety, as well as the mayor's um, housing executive officer, met to with about 15 different developers to start pulling out those things. We'd already done quite a bit of streamlining work with the supportive housing ordinance and the um, motel conversion ordinance. And how do we, you know, go further in removing those those roadblocks? And um, so that group has already come up with a huge laundry list of things that it's dividing into quick changes and higher impact changes that might require ordinances to bring to you or legislation to bring to um, Sacramento. And each of our departments holds this as a really important goal and is working to reduce the timelines and make approvals easier. And the mayor has, um, in addition to Executive Directive 13, which talked mostly about planning and, and those barriers, has um, done uh, more recent executive directives that, that go deeper into departments like building and safety and uh, DWP. So, um, you know, your question highlights something that we definitely need to do more work on. I think the question about private sector investments and like urban awnings, um, you know, I, I'm not, I, I uh, didn't visit Las Vegas to see the urban awnings project with there were a few people from the city who did um, but uh, you know as I understand it it's basically the idea is that it uh, it's, a, it's an architect architectural approach to making costs um, cheaper and almost all of the private sector investments that bring that idea use the same principle which is we're not going to ask the city for any money because that brings requirements like, you know, um, prevailing wage and other things that would add to the cost. 
All we want is sort of streamlining of approvals and removal of barriers. And, um, you know, I think those, those sorts of things are really important. I would say that even though they are usually not asking the city for any capital money. That's sorry, what I'm sorry. Are you, are you telling me that when, when the bureaucracy, the red tape of, of local, state, federal government is out of the way, we can build quicker, cheaper, faster. Is that what you're telling me? Not always. And, and um, so if there's no, if, if, you, if you just are, you know, Ann Sewell and you want to go out and build a 20-unit apartment building and, and you have all the money that you need, you know, um, to do it, then um, obviously you're going, to t you're going to remove all the time spent in getting people to approve the financial part, but you still have to go through the process of getting... Um, your plans approved and your zoning and all that kind of stuff. If you are trying to take advantage of the things that we attach to affordability, like um, a TOC ordinance or, or um, a density bonus that has affordability, then you're going to trigger some of those same you know, reviews. Um, one of the things that people who are trying to do it with no capital money from the city or from anybody else do though to make these things affordable because there is no magic basically you know you're trying to build something the market can't provide for if the market could provide it the market would have been providing it um, so you know you're trying to build something for people who cannot afford to pay enough rent to to pay off the mortgage that it costs to build that thing so a lot of folks that are doing things like the urban awnings project are trying to rely on um, fairly generous operating subsidy contracts that usually are available from county programs like um, the Department of Health Services, the Office of Diversion, Department of Mental Health. And those are great. I mean, those do allow you to move more quickly from a capital side. I would say that, you know, having done this for decades, the challenge is they usually are not forever. So you'll they'll run for a short period of time, and then when those contracts are up, that building's going to have a hard time continuing to be something that serves homeless people. It will probably convert to some other use. So um, it's a great way to move forward somewhat quickly, but it's not necessarily going to give you the same long-term sustainability. But I do think it's important, and we should find ways to remove those barriers so that those projects could get could get built more easily. All right. Uh, 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 Members of, of the committee, um, uh, I'll, I'll remind you the uh, time is now known. Uh, we'll go as long as we need to. Uh, simply remind you of the hour, Mr. De Leon. Mr. Chair, I was going to ask. You know, and um, the, the point that that Mr. Buscaino brought up in, in general, the, the concept of innovation and, and creativity and efficiency, and you know whether you know private sector folks, you know, can figure out you know how to build a. a a more efficient mouse trap, a better light bulb, if you will. Um, isn't that a, isn't that a good thing? And then when we talk about the fifty year covenants and what's the use of that physical asset post, we as policymakers don't we sort of kind of decide that as well too? Because you said it to me earlier this morning, Mr. Chair, you're you're unmuted. Sir. I guess what I want to say is the decades of. Stop manipulating my machine, uh, Mr. Booster. No, thank you so much. <laughs> it wasn't me, honest. The, the decades of the, the, the current you know, housing paradigm that we have, um, I, I just don't think, by any objective measure, I think anyone would agree that it, it just doesn't work and that we can, we can look at all the, the, the very fancy PowerPoint decks that are highly utilized you know, here and all you have to do is look out the window and you look at the crises and there's like a, a disconnection between the PowerPoint decks that I've witnessed numerously and looking outside the window or going into Skid Row and I, I just don't see that, that, that connection. So I think that in many ways any innovative product that, the, that, that gives us the outcomes that we want to house as many people as possible uh, to provide them a modicum of dignity and respect is is is, is important to sort of explore. I, I think there's a, a prevailing mindset. It doesn't make it doesn't matter how much it costs. It doesn't matter how long it takes. We're going to have something that's going to be built sometime into the future, regardless of what price point it is. 
and we're doing something that's mission oriented. So we're doing a good thing. And I think it's about outcomes. It's not about if it's a good thing or not. And I think that, again, you know, I want to go back to what I said earlier, the, the current stack financing system, and albeit you, you'll make several good points. You know, it's not like Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan, or Chase, or, or B of A, or, 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 or stumbling over themselves to provide the capital necessary. Because ultimately, whether it's TCAC credit, federal, state, county, no place like home that I wrote, that's $2 billion, that quite frankly I'm concerned is going to be not utilized well in terms of how it's appropriated. It's $2.1 billion, one-time dollars. Um, that's ultimately taxpayer dollars. It's not private sector dollars. It's actually, it's not investor dollars. It's, it's taxpayer dollars, and we have to utilize it. So I think to Mr. Buscaino's point, and I don't mean to, to represent you know, him accurately, but I think that I think we have to put everything on the table to figure out the most innovative ways to provide housing in whatever shape it looks like. And, you know, I, I think that it, it's worth exploring, you know, I, and, you know, all the innovative products. And to your point, you know, we don't know what happens in 50 years, you know, and what well, we can work together and figure out, you know, how does that fixed asset stay, you know, mission oriented for those at the lowest economic strata so someone can always enjoy, have access to that type of, 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 of housing you know, in, 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 in perpetuity and how we deal with that, I think is, is just important. So I, I just want to say that, you know, in, in short, we, we got to really explore everything and, and, and anything and everything, because I think the status quo is, is not working. I think this works for smaller municipalities like a Pasadena, uh, perhaps like a Culver City, you know, uh, where you have a lot of room to play with. The magnitude of the crisis is so huge in L.A., that um, our options are very limited, and we have to really explore uh, innovative, you know, ways of, of financing uh, these types of these types of deals. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. To Mr. De Leon's point, yes. I mean, something that we can pose the question as as a body: How do we overcome um, prevailing wage strict fire codes? This is why I'm I'm sold on the urban awnings. It's a union built project. Um, so at this time, at the same time, it's more expensive to build in our city, in our state, prevailing wage, strict fire codes. But now the members, we're in a bizarre position where what we're seeing, we're seeing a record low of structure fires um, while we're seeing a record high of, uh, of sidewalk deaths and encampment fires. Where's a priority? Fair enough. Uh, there's an additional response to Mr. Uh, Buscaino's uh, initial question. Uh, Ms. Marston, did you want to uh, seek to respond to him? Yes, thank you. And I'm actually going to turn it to Amy Perkins, who's our Director of Housing Central Command for LASA. All thank right. You. Thank you so much, Councilman. So, yes. yeah, the, the question was, how does LASA's Housing Central Command share information regarding unit availability and vacancies? So Housing Central Command organizes our permanent supportive housing inventory in a system that we call RMS, Resource Management System. So within RMS, we include all of the permanent supportive housing units that we track, and then we track the tenant-based vouchers. So those are like the you, you know, a classically called Section 8 voucher that someone's walking around with to try to use in fair market housing. So we track those resources. At this point, we have um, almost 12,000 of those in RMS. So the way that the, the vacancies get out into the community is when, let's take, for example, a PSH building. So a permanent supportive housing building gets a vacancy. They go into that vacancy, into the resource management system, and then those units are matched. They're matched through our coordinated entry system. And so a SPA-level matcher would get the information there's a vacancy, and then they uh, will find a client who meets the eligibility requirements, and they will match the client to that unit. They'll notify their point of contact, and the whole process is started. So the work of Housing Central Command is, is, is multiple. Uh, we have multiple goals. One, we're trying to make sure that we understand exactly what is coming along in the pipeline. We know exactly our existing inventory 
of PSH housing, whether that be project-based, the units, or the tenant-based resources. And then additionally, we have our lease-up program that is operated by PATH and funded by LASA, and they are the people that are going out to recruit new fair market landlords, and then they, um, they have their lease-up program where they put all of these fair market rent units, and then case managers can go into the lease-up program and say, oh, here are different units where a landlord might accept this tenant-based voucher, or they might accept this rapid rehousing subsidy. So there's really two different places where we're collecting information on the units that our clients can use. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perkins, for uh, that report and, and that response. Uh, again, um, I think we owe it not only to uh, our houseless residents, but also to our residents uh, and businesses uh, alike that we need to provide them with real-time uh, information. And when everyone's in charge, no one's in charge, but I appreciate you breaking that down for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, more to come on that score. Uh, Final question, uh, I guess, uh, goes to the team, and it's posed to Mr. Wickham, Ms. Barclay. Uh, you're prepared to respond to the chair's uh, uh, query about what is our organizing principle? What holds this together? What uh, are we really doing in the name of a comprehensive uh, crisis response to strategy? Uh, in other words, what say ye? Uh, good morning, council members. Uh, Meg Barclay, city homeless coordinator in the CIO's office. Um, I would say, um, well, as, as I discussed in the presentation, um, when we opened up the presentations last week, the city's comprehensive homeless strategy was amended pretty substantially in 2019 to be organized around the issues and the actions that municipal governments like the city of LA are have the authority to and the resources to implement. And I think that that fits in nicely to um, what you saw um, in the presentation of LASA's um, strategic plan around sort of four main components of an effective homeless response system with prevention being one of them, housing being another one, the rehousing system, the third, and the fourth being outreach. The city of L, and so if we use that as a framework of like, we need all of these four main components to be functioning well and, um, and sufficiently to address the need, the city's response really should fall heavily in the housing box. Obviously, we finance a lot of supportive and affordable housing. We also have oversight over policies around zoning and other types of um, other types of incentives to affect affordability citywide. Um, and also looking and responsibility to implement RENA goals and things like that. Um, and then also in the in the rehousing system, um, the city has um, well, we fund LASA to do a lot of the things that the rehousing system's job is. Um, and so we are, and, and also within the outreach, same, same thing. Um, those are really, I would say, keeping a really strong eye on those four components and where the city has the strongest authority and resources to act um, and but also keeping an eye on sort of where the accountability and the, um, the sort of same types of resources and authority lie in the other, in the other boxes as well. Um, it's been a really helpful way for me to think about sort of, um, you know, how these things work or should work. I think as a municipal government, um, you know, obviously people become homeless for a lot of different reasons. Um, and when they're homeless on the streets of the city of LA, um, the especially city council government is held most accountable for the impacts of that. But there are a lot of upstream things that happen that result in the situation that we have now that are falling out, fall in boxes that are not really where the city has funding or authority or a mandate to act. And so it's helpful for me to think about it within those um, within those four sort of components of an effective um, homelessness response system. So that's sort of where I would um, 
and I think John was going to talk some about governance and other um, issues that are kind of happening right now. Yeah, please do so, um, Mr. Wickham. But I, I want to say, Ms. Barclay, the, the question that I will uh, continue to pose is the following. Uh, and it's in part designed to be somewhat provocative, but um, what does alignment really look like? Um, if there are outcomes to be achieved by more collaboration between the city and the county, how does that get spelled out? How does that get operationalized? We came forth in 2015 with um, a joint set of recommendations, city and county, same day, symbolizing our collaboration, uh, but there is a need at some point to drill down into those respective recommendations and ask the question of alignment. It goes to the question of how effective we are really being in terms of uh, the work around homelessness. Mm -hmm. uh, John Wickham, John Wickham, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, let me see what you have to say for yourself, sir. It would be great if we could hear you. You're on mute, John. You're sounding good so far. I've been on mute for so long. Good afternoon, members. Um, so uh, to your point, Councilman, I, I, and to, to what Meg had described, I think there was a lot of work going on in a homelessness response system without actually understanding what the structure of it was. And the comprehensive homeless uh, uh, efforts by the county and the city were a start to put some structure onto that system. The home, the the strategic planning that Lhasa did, to, to my mind, was an extraordinary step in actually synthesizing the boxes very well. And to to me, show Meg used the word upstream. To me, it crystallized in my mind this, this metaphor of a, a river with a really big waterfall on it. And we've got all of our resources down at the base of the waterfall. And we need to do more work upstream before people go over the waterfall and before maybe even they get into the river, right? One of the things that has um, come along in the, in the last year, the city, the county, and the LASA commission are all evaluating loss of governance and we're doing this individually as agencies as well as collaboratively so that we can all work together to come to a, a clear understanding of how the system works from a governance standpoint there have been a lot of interviews a lot of conversations on the subject matter the loss of commission i believe is hearing a report tomorrow on their findings the county will be releasing their report shortly, and your CLA will be re releasing a report as well. And embedded into that are our options for and alternatives for the for um, the best way to govern this system. And I think the critical part in there is this question of alignment. I think all of the parties are seeing that it's it's extremely important to figure out where the different lanes are, how everybody is aligned in those lanes to be most effective. And that we don't have that um, as clearly understood as we should. And I think your, your meeting today goes to show that when Dr. Sai was discussing, um, you know, substance abuse and programs that we have. Clearly there's a lot of work going on. There needs to be better alignment there needs to be um, better sharing of information so that uh, we can um, get this get this system tuned up. Uh, thank you very much for uh, those remarks, uh, members of the committee. Uh, we've gone through each member's questions and we've gotten responses. Uh, I do not uh, wish to suggest that the responses are exhaustive or conclusive. Uh, so as to imply that there are other questions that uh, shouldn't be posed as we uh, go forward in our deliberations over the, the balance of the work we have to do. Um, I just simply want to say that we will 
satisfy ourselves for now uh, that uh, we have raised the item uh, number one uh, and done it justice in terms of your uh, due diligence and the uh, the clarity that the presenters uh, chose to bring to bear, um, uh, underscoring the need for uh, better and more effective uh, collaboration among the respective um, uh, stakeholders. Much more to be uh, said on that. We'll learn a lot more when we get uh, the LASA report from the city, the county, and LASA itself on governance, as uh, John just made reference to. Uh, but for now, if it satisfies the committee, uh, I'd like for us to entertain um, receiving and filing part uh, A of uh, item number one, which is the here a comprehensive uh, crisis response um, report from the respective uh, entities. Um, and if there's no objection, we will receive and file that report that the uh, part B essentially is uh, to, uh, I'm prepared to move that we adopt uh, the right to housing, a uh, motion for a 60 day report back um, uh, pursuant to the discussion uh, that we've entertained up to this point. And I'm prepared to um, ask if there's a second to that motion. Uh, second. Second. All right. Uh, is there any further discussion to be entertained uh, on uh, that item? Seeing none, uh, Madam Clerk, uh, please uh, call the roll on item number one. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, Council Member Lee Thomas is chair. Aye, on the right to housing. Council Member De Leon. Aye. Council Member Buscaino. Aye. Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. Council Member Raman. Aye. Uh, thank you very much, members. Uh, let's then proceed uh, to item number five. Um, it's uh, scheduled. We've invited um, uh, Councilman uh, Mike Bonin, uh, who uh, authored the motion along with um, our committee member, uh, Bonin, um, and would like to uh, ask uh, the two of them if they would... Uh, open the discussion uh, for us um, and um, proceed from that very uh, point. This is obviously an item of high concern for all of us. Uh, Council Member Rahman or Council Member Bonham, what is your pleasure? Uh, th thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you uh, uh, to my co-author, uh, Councilmember Rahman. Thanks to the committee for having me. I've been listening to most of the, the committee meeting this morning, and it's been most informative. I want to thank you for the discussion. Uh, it's also been very interesting to learn that Mr. De Leon is our new budget hawk, and I've been very interested to hear, Mr. Ridley Thomas, about your leftist leanings. I'll have my staff send over a number of motions that I'll, I'll see that you'll uh, be interested in co-sponsoring, I'm sure. Uh, Appreciate your encouragement. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, thanks for, for hearing this item today at your first meeting since it was uh, submitted. The item today, as, as everybody knows, is about uh, taking advantage of the incredible uh, and unique opportunity that the Biden administration has given us to, to move thousands, if not tens of thousands of people off the street. Uh, as we have learned throughout this pandemic, uh, the, the, the method that we have often relied upon for uh, emergency housing, uh, uh, congregate shelters, does not work for this moment, does not work for this crisis. Uh, and we have had the opportunity, which we have used to a certain extent since the beginning of the pandemic, to use Project Room Key and to move people into motels and hotel rooms which have been underutilized. Uh, helping save those those buildings, helping save those operations, and addressing both the public health crisis and the moral crisis of homelessness. With FEMA reimbursing to 75%, that was an opportunity for the city and for the county, but it posed some challenges. With the federal government now saying we will reimburse retroactively to 100%, that is a tremendous opportunity for, for Los Angeles that, 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 that I hope that we will meet uh, aggressively and with determination and seize the, the full moment of it. 
it is very easy to say, well, you know, there's going to be some cash flow problems or there's bureaucratic reasons not to do it. All of that is true, but I hope that, that, that we will seize this moment with, with gusto and say, yes, there are challenges, but we will meet them and we will overcome them. The expression is, where there's a will, there's a way. Where there's 100% FEMA funding, there has got to be a way. And what we ask for in this motion is for uh, the city and, and hopefully the county, I know the county's considering this, to, to move aggressively on this and to seize the, the maximum opportunity from this moment and use as many hotel and motel rooms uh, as possible. There have been things that have uh, hobbled us in the past. Part of them was money. Part of them is we didn't want to be dealing with some of the smaller uh, hotels and motels. And some of them were we didn't want to be dealing with the bigger uh, hotels. Uh, and I think we have an opportunity now to say to every operator in Los Angeles, we want to use this program uh, with you and we want to make this work. Uh, I would even suggest that we may want to come up with a master uh, template to at least start discussions, not approach each hotel or motel individually, not wait for them to call us, but to say to the city of Los Angeles, here's what we can do Anybody interested, let's talk. Here's our starting point. And if you're okay with this contract the way it is, we're good to go and we can sign this and, and we can get an operator and start moving folks in. The motion also asks that we uh, look at uh, how the program has operated. I know from my experience, at least in my part of town, that many people have uh, dropped out of Project Roomkey. I don't know how, what those numbers are, what those stats are, but many people uh, have balked at some of the restrictions on the operations, saying, wait a minute, the, the, the house neighbors next door get to come and go, uh, but I'm told I have a curfew, or I'm told uh, I can only leave for two hours a day, which makes going to the doctor's difficult, which makes uh, going to my job difficult or finding a job difficult. So I want us to actually be talking to people who are unhoused, as well as the service agencies, but particularly those unhoused, about how Room Key has been working and how it can be made better uh, and more successful. And, and the other thing this motion does, and it's been the, the more controversial element of it, is it, it asks city attorney to tell us what our ability is to, to commandeer hotels and motels. Uh, uh, if we have the ability, uh, and we are not getting enough opportunity from, from, from those who are willing, we need to have the tough conversations about whether or not we need to be uh, looking at, at seizing for the duration of this crisis under the emergency powers granted through this public health crisis, uh, uh, seizing some of, of, of those hotels or motels and using them. I have spoken before that I think some of the first places we should look are those hotels that have benefited from public benefit or from public subsidy or public investment uh, in the past. There have been uh, a, a detailed legal memo from Munger, Tolls, and Olson, um, which has uh, explained the city's ability to do this under these circumstances compensating these hotels, of course, uh, and the city of San Francisco has weighed in on this as well. Their city attorney has opined that they have the authority to, to do this as well. So this asks our city attorney to do that for us. Uh, we've seen the city attorney act very expeditiously when we've had uh, uh, requests from certain council members to reconsider revisions to, to 4118 or or, or 5611, uh, we would like to get as, as urgent and as quick an analysis from city attorney so we know what our maximum ability is uh, so we can seize this. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you have you've said most recently we, we need to be meeting this crisis by, by, by acting uh, faster and acting more aggressively and acting smarter. And this opportunity presented to us from the Biden administration for 100% reimbursement Retroactive and going to at least uh, September is a huge opportunity and one we hope we can seize. And I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Bond. Ms. Rahman? Um, you know, I think that was a, that was a great um, summary of, of the spirit behind this motion. And, and um, I'm really grateful to um, Councilmember Bonin for being here and for representing um, this position so eloquently. I just wanted to just underscore three quick things. One is just am being ambitious at this moment. I think a lot of people are talking about room key right now, but I hear really different numbers. 
And I want to really push us to be as ambitious as possible. Like, I think I, I've heard from the city, and I'm really excited that Mayor Garcetti is so excited about, you know, not just maintaining our existing numbers of rooms, but adding many more rooms. But I've heard the word hundreds, and I really want to think about thousands, thousands of hotel rooms, because I do think we have the opportunity to do that, given that resources through the FEMA reimbursement are not an issue right now. Um, I also want to underscore that word urgency. I mean, this, you know, I know that this is, um, I'm learning <laughs> that the council uh, moves slowly and that the processes through which we make these decisions are sometimes very cumbersome and slow. But I just want to say that, you know, September gives us eight months of runway right now. Right, And every week that we wait to expand this program is a week that we take away from those eight months. And that's a week that we take away from being able to make sure that we structure this program such that every person who moves into a project room key room is able to then move afterwards into permanent housing that we can then think about funding through things like home key and, and money that's coming from both the state government and federal government for us to expand the number of units that we have available to us um, for, uh, for people experiencing homelessness right now. And the third thing I want to do, and I would love to do that with this committee, and I would love to do that, you know, uh, you know just as individuals, as constituents of our state government, um, I want to really take this moment to identify very clearly the barriers to expansion and really focus very closely on those barriers. Because I've been, you know, I've been talking to people across the landscape of the city, the county, trying to understand what are the barriers to expanding room key now that we have this 100% reimbursement. And over and over again, I hear that our city's financial crisis is really the major barrier. Our state is not ex experiencing that same fiscal crunch at all. It is just not. It has billions of dollars at its disposal. And every elected representative, particularly those representatives that, that represent us here in Los Angeles, has the same interest that we do in using, seizing this moment to use every dollar that we can to address this crisis. And it's not money that we will have to spend. We will get it back. It's free money. So this is a moment where we can, you know, this is, I heard over and over again during our presentation this morning that we don't have enough resources to address this crisis. Guess what? We just got it. And so I think we have to really put pressure on the state whether it's through this body, whether it is as individuals, whether it is as, you know, uh, uh, through our, the organizations and network of community organizations that we are all a part of, we have to demand that the state step up and provide us this advanced funding so that we can take advantage of this eight-month timeline, really do this right. And we can't wait another two weeks, another three weeks to move forward on this. We really have to move very quickly. So thank you. Thank you. Hashtag no more excuses. Thank you so much. Um, so, um, Matt Sable from the mayor's office is on uh, the line and committee. Um, uh, Mr. Sable, did you have any um, uh, comments you wanted to offer for the committee's uh, consideration or edification? Uh, Mr. Chairman, no, no comments um, uh, to, to start with, but I just, uh, I'm, I'm here. Um, Matt Zabo, Deputy Chief of Staff to the Mayor. Uh, Chair Ramirez, Deputy Mayor for uh, City Homelessness Initiatives, is also here, available to answer questions on the Mayor's action that he took last night to transfer $75 million to front the costs of the extension of three large hotels. Um, and any other questions you may have about um, how we intend to proceed moving forward. Um. Well, I, I want to offer the, the following. Um, you know, this is a program we absolutely must expand. Uh, we acknowledge the initiative of the governor's office uh, to launch it. Um, um, and uh, as noted earlier, um, you know, the existing program at its peak uh, included some 40 hotels um, across the county of Los Angeles. Never before had we uh, been able to move uh, approximately 4,000 people um, off the streets of uh, the county of Los Angeles in uh, uh, that period of time, namely um, uh, 
uh, two to three months. But I believe if we work together, we can go further. And that's the thrust of this motion, uh, further to expand this uh, vital resource. Um, if we can overcome some of the challenges, we can get some of the, uh, the bugs out uh, uh, that we um, confronted uh, initially um, in terms of local front, uh, funding and nonprofit capacity to provide services on site. I mean, these were real issues. And, you know, securing the next step, uh, which is essentially that of permanent uh, housing, uh, we have to think about that now because these funds uh, don't uh, exist in perpetuity. And so we've got to do the thinking now because the last thing we wanted to do when we first launched uh, Project Room Key was to house people for a short period of time and then have to turn them back into the streets. That's just not an alternative uh, that we are prepared to entertain. I think I want to request that uh, the city reach out um, uh, as a part of this effort to the uh, hotel stakeholders and uh, community hotel organizations so that they can uh, quickly identify uh, the hotels that are ready to partner uh, with the city to expand operation or project from key that model. Uh, we shouldn't make this uh, a tedious or laborious process uh, if they are ready, if they are interested, let them come forth, uh, initiate. Uh, obviously, uh, this is not a matter of philanthropy. This is not a matter of uh, doing anything but trying to get to a win-win scenario from a business perspective, from employment perspective that speaks to economic justice. After all, uh, these are they who are uh, suffering as a result of having lost their jobs. We know from our conversations with uh, Unite Here, uh, the radical loss of uh, membership uh, in this industry. We know further uh, that we have to uh, do all that we can because these are they who are the essential workers who are taking the brunt of COVID-19 and the like. And so obviously this is to help uh, the homeless, to rescue those who are the most vulnerable. But this moves beyond uh, that. This has uh, economic implications for business owners as well as employees. And so uh, this is a, a triple bottom line consideration and we have to be very attentive uh, to every aspect of those items. Well, members of the committee, I don't know if there are additional questions or comment. I note the hand, the hand of Council Member Buscaino. I note the hand of Council Member Rodriguez. Uh, if there are questions that uh, you wish to ask of uh, Mr. Sabo uh, in terms of the $75 million, um, that the mayor uh, spoke to and the alignment with the governor's office in that regard, I'll feel free to do so. Floor is yours, Mr. Bustaino, followed by Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Mr. Bond and Ms. Raman, for continuing to, to lead on uh, uh, with urgency on um, helping the most vulnerable among us. Um, I have a um, letter from the Hotel Association that was submitted today uh, clearly indicated that the talk of commandeering is not, not helpful. Uh, keep in mind, I'm reminded um, here in San Pedro, we were, I believe, one of the first or the first hotel um, to, um, we, I mean, it wasn't called Project Room Key early in, in, in April, um, but we were able to move 100 souls off the sidewalks of cars into uh, a safe and secure location um, in the hotel in downtown San Pedro. Um, my question, you know, referring to the, the letter that was sent to us by the Hotel Association of LA, it states that 30,000 rooms were offered to the county. So my question, what are the reasons that only 4,000 rooms are being used today for Project Room Key? What, what happened? Uh, why, why didn't the other 29,000 rooms work out? Uh, uh, Tomorrow, are you posing the question, Mr. Busano? 
either either to um, to Mr. Zabo or anyone from from the county. Uh, I don't know that there's anyone uh, on the county from the county on the line still. Uh, Meg, Meg, maybe. Yeah, this is Meg Barclay, uh, City Homes Court in the CIA. Meg, are you are you from the are you from the county, Meg? No, I'm not. Sorry, I was. <laughs> Go right ahead. The city and the county, though, did work together in the wrapping up of Room Key, especially yeah. as it related to coordinating around hotels that were located in the city of LA. I'm I'm not entirely I'm not familiar with the original offer of thirty thousand rooms. I actually that's I wasn't aware of that at the time. I just know that a lot of the county hotels were smaller, like less than way less than a hundred rooms, and it may have just been a, a um. A matter of, of they got as many of those hotels under contract as they could until it looked like it was going to be. Time well, we can, I can just tell you, it's not like you can snap your finger and this happened. There was a lot of resistance. There was a lot of resistance. Uh, we ended up in lawsuits with some of the other cities in the county uh, that um, prevented us from making it happen. Uh, uh, we ultimately prevailed in many of those instances. In addition to that. Uh, Mr. Busca, I know this is not an inexhaustible supply of resources to drive this. Uh, you know, um, to the extent that that is the case, this is a finite proposition from a fiscal perspective. And so the question is, how do you maximize uh, efficiencies here? How do you cause it? Just because the federal government says they'll do 100%, um, that doesn't mean there isn't a lid uh, as it relates to FEMA. Uh, FEMA doesn't function from an unlimited budget vantage point. And so I will simply say to you, we can do a lot, and we should do more, and we, as I said earlier, should overcome any impediments that we can. But I don't think we ought to be other than the second impression that um, uh, this is a, limit, a bottomless uh, supply of resources. But we ought to run hard, and we ought to run fast. Sorry, can I just can I just intervene really quickly? Just from the reports that came out, um, I think from uh, Councilmember Bonin and Marquis Harris Dawson's request to ask yes. some of the hotels why they couldn't participate, and from some of the analyses that came out of the county, I think a big part of why hotels weren't able to participate was a rule that you had to have over a hundred rooms that really limited a lot of participation. Mm -hmm. I think that was a result of concerns about being able to manage a lot of smaller sites. But in I think in talking to some of the service providers, that doesn't seem to be as much of a concern anymore. anymore so I think right. taking away that limitation would be a very, very smart thing in expanding the number of hotel rooms that are available. I also wanted to say that there were some logistical concerns. Any hotels that had other kinds of residents, some hotels are half um, hotel, half apartments, those weren't right. able to be utilized, um, and any places that already had other kinds of uh, um, guests in them, like a lot of them were hosting essential workers or, um, you know, other kinds of guests that were still using those rooms during the pandemic, those were also not able to be utilized. So there were some real reasons for why those numbers were not as, you know, didn't go up to 30,000. Right. But I do think that some of those were our restrictions, meaning our the collective hour, uh, and um, we could remove those restrictions based on the learnings that we had from doing this for as long as we have. Right. I would just point out, though, we the I, we were the the prioritization of hotels that had a hundred rooms or more was really also around making sure that we could get as much bang for our um, you know work time, staff time, buck. Um, we got. I mean, at the end. With all of the hotels that the city contracted, we ended up with almost at least a third of the inventory in, of the countywide inventory in six hotels. Um, and you know that contracts, the occupancy contracts are pretty much the same kind of level of of oversight and work. To, no matter how many rooms there are in the hotel, so we were trying to get as many rooms with the with. Um, with the effort that we had to to put towards this, so I think that there's some looking at economies of scale really worked well for the city's um, for the city sponsored program, um, but I absolutely I mean there were and yeah 
So anyway, I just wanted to point that out, that we can get... Yeah. Okay. That was the spirit of collaboration and the, the spirit of working with the hotel operators, not just demanding that we're going to take over your hotel. And, and maybe, I mean, did the city or county agree to indemnify or hold harmless hotel owners? Because that could possibly be the reason why there wasn't more participation. I'm trying to remember. I don't remember the specifics. Uh, we did Mike, have... Um, is, is that a question for the city attorney? I think there's a city attorney on the call. Yeah, I know Meg was in the um, on the ground here and, and working with uh, PRK. Um, yes, uh, I don't want Meg, Meg to uh, practice law and get herself and then do the harm. Thank you very much. <laughs> Where's the city attorney when you need it? Are you on the line? In the room. I had a note that said you were showing he, up. He's on. He's on, Mr. Chair. Uh, PD, I think you have to unmute. Good, 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 good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, good, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and, and uh, members of the committee. Uh, my understanding is that each each of the uh, agreements with each respective hotel was different. I don't know if it was uh, set in terms of indemnification. It's definitely something um, that we did not offer um, or, or, or seek to offer. Um, but in, in certain cases, it, it might have been uh, the, the attorney that drafted those agreements, so I, I can't comment on specifics. All right, I think it's important to know what impediments there may have been because we wish not to be uh, beset by them in this instance. I, I, I iron out all the difficulties, all right? I, that could be one of them. Also, yeah, the hotel absolutely. association letter. Uh, I actually just... Go ahead. Um, yes, I, I did receive um, word from. Yes, I did receive um, confirmation from my office that we did indemnify the hotel owners for for damage or uh, potential cause of damage. Okay. The uh, in many cases, the county, uh, according to the hotel association letter, that the county had not had enough medical and mental health professionals to support the thousands of individuals the county and city of L.A. wanted to engage. Um, anyone from LASA can respond to that on the call, on the, on the, on the social services piece? Council Member Jose Delgado. I think it's fair to us. Oh. Yeah, go right in. Yes, Jose Delgado, Director of Government Affairs for LASA. Uh, in, in terms of the service provision, uh, again, this was an emergency response, so the priority was to get folks indoors with sort of the bare board uh, uh, services to get folks in with basic provision around like nursing, uh, food provision and things of that nature. So the sort of more comprehensive services or mental health and things of that nature were not sort of the prior top priority for, for the execution of the operation. Okay, so I can see why the hotel operators had set deep concerns uh, about, um, you know, uh, being able to provide a service that can't provide the, the social wraparound services at, at the site as well. Uh, City Attorney on the call, um, your boss issued a public report dated 21021 that states, under the mayor's emergency powers, he has the authority to commandeer property for the protection of life and bind the city to the fair market value. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so um, it's it's under the mayor's purview to commandeer property for the protect, protection of life and bind the city to the fair market value, not not the body of the city council, correct? That is correct. That is how the admin code is drafted. Okay, so it's it's it's, it's not clear to me that I I feel that it's not clear to me that the hotel industry is to blame for more rooms not being made available. Uh, in the project room key, the industry has been decimated by the pandemic. It's clear, uh, seen some financial, um, and, and has had a clear financial interest to participate. But I don't think talk about commandeering is helpful, as a city attorney reports makes clear. Only the mayor has the authority to do so. So we shouldn't give false hope that this is something the city council has any authority or say in the matter. But I do support looking at ways to increase voluntary participation in the program, similar to what we've done here in, in my district. So I'd like to make, entertain a motion, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move uh, to strike the fourth moving clause in as much as the city attorney has already provided a written report.
dated 2-10-21 on the feasibility of commandeering hotel. Strike that language. All right, the matter is before us as um, brought to the attention of the committee by Mr. Buscaino. Is there any discussion on that uh, matter? I'm, I guess I'm just confused about if the report is already available, why would it need to be struck from the motion? Uh, sorry, that may be a procedural question, but just wondering why. Well, I think it, it's, it's the case that the uh, it has to be the committee has to be satisfied that the response uh, that the city attorney chose to speak to is precisely what the author and co-author of the motion was uh, seeking to understand. Uh, that's not clear to me, Mr. Uh, you know, we have potentially a partial response, uh, and to the extent that it is a, a, a specific question that uh, the motion seeks to explore uh, as to what uh, the scope and authority of the city uh, is in terms of uh, moving in that direction. I uh, would simply want to say that uh, we should be all about incentivizing uh, the um, hotels to participate uh, with us uh, in doing this work. I think there's readiness in the environment. Uh, if it's the will of the body uh, to explore uh, compelling uh, an entity to participate, um, it's reasonable uh, perhaps to know the extent, uh, the scope, uh, the substance of our capacity to do so. Um, and so in response to the motion, uh, I think the city attorney is uh, obliged to be spot on in terms of what uh, that office's best knowledge is of what we can or cannot do. I do not believe, uh, at least for uh, all members of the committee, uh, it is to be thought that uh, we should uh, be in the business of commandeering uh, anyone's assets. The, the motion itself uh, asks for an explanation of our capacity to do that. It is not a motion that essentially says we shall uh, do so. And I think it is reasonable to uh, at least be knowledgeable as to what our authority is. You began to parse that, Mr. Buscaino, by saying it is not the council uh, that can even touch it, um, and uh, it lies squarely within the purview of the mayor's office. I think it would be helpful for all that to be in the body of a response uh, pursuant to this motion, without prejudice. Uh, and that's essentially how I think it would be appropriate to dispose of this. All right, um, Mr. Buscaino, uh, any further comments on that? Yeah, and if, if the direction of the city attorney is to uh, have the council change the admin code for, to give us the authority to commandeer property, <laughs> that should be as such. Uh, otherwise, I can't move forward on, on supporting this. All right. All right. Um, are there any other questions or comments on the matter before us, which is item number five? Uh, Mr. Chair? Uh, Madam... Councilwoman. Thank you. Um, and, and uh, you know, Mr. Buscaino, I, I understand your concerns that you're raising. This was uh, more of an instruction to report back on what that would look like, but it's not an instruction to execute uh, that action. And, and there's a difference between the two. And so I think uh, just to be mindful of that. Um, Mr. Delgado? Yes, Councilmember. Hi. So, you know, one of the, first of all, I want to, I want to remind uh, colleagues, for, for those that aren't aware, I, you know, we've had tremendous success with Project Room Key in my district uh, with the largest encampment on record, uh, having 100% housed from Paxton and Bradley. 70% of them now have been placed into permanent supportive housing since that operation uh, back in May. And so, uh, and I want to thank LASA for its work and participation in helping to navigate around cell trends and all the things that we had to do for that. That said, one of the biggest struggles that we know we faced, uh, and it was mentioned uh, just briefly, 
I had asked uh, the CAO when we were talking about what is the what is the sweet spot in terms of the, the maximum capacity uh, service providers can handle to help manage a project room key facility? So how, what is the maximum number of rooms? What is the minimum number of rooms? Can I, can I get that for the record, please? Uh, council member, uh, that, that would vary depending on the service provider. Uh, as you know, every service provider across the county uh, has a, a variety of different workloads that they're currently doing, and so uh, Project Room Key was just sort of a, an emergency response, and so uh, it was safe to say that everyone sprung into action and pitched in wherever they could. Uh, it, is, it is an understatement to say that folks were stretched thin, and so every provider, uh, based on the different service planning area across the county, would have that capacity. Uh, as Meg mentioned, the, um, the, the, the variability in, in terms of the 100, that, that magical 100 number, uh, that was sort of a, a easy number that was posted up based on availability of service provider, their capacity, in addition to like um, the administrative staff to comply with all the different food vendors, the security aspect, uh, and, and just something to reiterate, uh, adding to the question of, of Council Member Bruce Gaino, the service provision and services, not that there was anything comprehensive, but there was always an attempt as folks were uh, entered into Project Room Key locations to begin working with them to connect them to the long-term uh, housing uh, resources that were allocated to them. So it wasn't like they were just uh, like a typical interim housing location. There we was an effort to really work with folks and plan out where they would be, you know, two, three months or after their stay was completed at a Project Room Key site. Right, because the ultimate goal, while we have the immediate need to house people, it's about the long-term solution of how we place them uh, to keep them housed. And That's so right. we can, we can uh, contract with a number of hotels, but that doesn't mean that we also have the service providers and the administration support at this time available to, uh, to help do that case management. So what is the timeline for LASA and what resources have been made available for you all to start hiring uh, to help accommodate and provide for that need? Because now that we know we're going to have the resources to be able to ramp up all these rooms, and I'm, you know, I remain very optimistic about the cooperation to secure these facilities, my bigger concern is that we need that case management and the administration to help better place these individuals into those permanent solutions, either uh, the reunification efforts that, that are ongoing, whatever the circumstances are. And so what is the process of hiring those folks? Where do your gaps lie? And how quickly are you going to are the service providers in a position to hire us so that we can meet the need for potentially thousands of rooms coming online? That's an excellent question. And those are discussions that... Um, have been ongoing and trying to really assess uh, and really survey our, our provision, our service provider community. As you know, these are the same people, like you mentioned, who are executing on the housing uh, from other programs itself. So uh, any, any uh, up ramping of training and to ensure that there's quality in that training and to make sure that the people running these sites um, are meeting the quality and standards that not just LASA expects, but the community where these housing locations and these project room key sites are located. These are all things that if, just like anything else, if you rush into it too quickly, um, you begin to having problems. And we understand the urgency uh, as this is being an, emergent, an emergency, but at the same time, we want to balance that out by ensuring that a, a, there's a success uh, tied at the, at the end of these operations. So to answer your question, those are ongoing discussions. I, I can't give the specific timeline, but those discussions are happening as we speak. And in terms of resources available to fund that, um, those would be eligible through uh, Measure H, correct? Those would be funded, uh, that would be eligible services covered by H? Or is that something that we would have to seek additional resources from the state or the federal government to help us cover those costs? The Measure H does have a small line item allo allocation for ongoing uh, technical assistance for providers to train them up on a variety of different things, not just the service provision, but also like the back end, front office stuff, finance, and things of that nature. Uh, I would have to go back and really talk to um, lots of internal staff to figure out what kind of resources would be needed to execute on that. Okay. Um, 
Mr. Chair. Yes. So lastly, uh, I, in the spirit of collaboration, um, as I started my comments, I'll be collaborative in, in supporting moving forward on the motion, but do want to make it clear um, I do um, oppose um, the fourth moving clause moving forward, but I understand that's going to come back to us. Um, just want to be, be on the record for that. Uh, clear enough. Uh, Mr. Wilson, we thank you for your uh, collaboration. Uh, Solidarity.cm today. Okay, now let's see if we can't uh, move forward. Are right. there are other comments to be set forth on item number five? Seeing none. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Please go right ahead. Uh, I just was saying we could also, you know. Uh, if you wanted to, uh, Mr. Buscaino, to include, um, uh, you know, as we consult uh, with members, we could also consult with hotel operators to see how the program could be made better so that more people of that yes. 30,000 pick it up. Yes. You know, I think that would be... That's a useful uh, amendment. Mm -hmm. Yep. We'll, we'll take that as an amendment to uh, the motion as it has been submitted. Uh, any other uh, questions or comments uh, on item number five? Ms. Raman moves. Yes. Mr. Buscaino uh, seconds. <laughs> and uh, the matter is before us, Madam uh, Clerk, as amended, please call the roll. Mr. Chair, uh, 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 number one, comment, Chair. Sorry? Council Member Ridley Thomas? Oh, thank you. Uh, aye. As amended. Council Member De Leon? Aye. Council Member Buscaino? Aye. Council Member Rodriguez? Aye. Council Member, Council, Council Member Raman? Aye. Sorry. All right, and forthwith to the Council, uh, Madam Clerk. Um, uh, would be the request. And, um, Madam Clerk, I understand that there's some other uh, cleanup items you wish to call to the attention of the chair. Yes, Mr. Is chair. Yes, Mr. Chair, for um, the items on the consent calendar, I just want to make a couple of clarifications. Um, at, the, at the request of the CLA, for items two, three, and four, um, the action taken by the committee, <clears throat> excuse me, is to adopt the recommendations in the CAO report noting that items two and three have revised resolutions and uh, the committee is also receiving and filing the um, HCIDLA reports on those items, sir. Um, in addition, for item number seven, um, I just wanted to gain clarification that the intention of the committee is to um, concur with the, with the Information Technology and General Services Committee's action um, as they amended the motion. And finally, for item number 11, um, the committee's action is to adopt the draft ordinance submitted by the um, city attorney as to form and legality. And that concludes the clarifications. Uh, are those, and those clarifications are appropriate, consistent with the committee's uh, wishes. Uh, anything more to come before us at this point in time? Members of the, com of the committee, Madam Clerk, Madam City Attorney, CLA, seeing none. We thank you uh, for your attendance. It's now 1 o'clock, uh, and we stand adjourned. Marathon. Bye. <laughs> 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 <laughs>